What are we starting with this week? I don't know. I don't know. It's We're the f- talking about our Spotify followers <sighs> and, and a number of other things. So I've got some cool information for you. Uh, we're getting close to a million, a million little listens. What the heck? Not Wee! on Spotify, we over everything. But on Spotify this past year, we have had so, so many listens. About... 300,000? That's too many. It's too many. Listen less. About over 100,000 on Apple. I haven't even counted to that high yet. I know, it's no. crazy. And also, Spotify followers, we've we've got about 20, just under 25K. Wow. wow. 25,000 Spotify followers. Very cool, very you've cool. Overtaking YouTube. Congratulations, Spotify. And because it's the last episode of the year, I also want to just talk about, uh, about our YouTube. We've over half a million views on YouTube as well in That's the past crazy. year. crazy. Thank you all very much. That is insane. That is wild. Blimey. So, uh, I do want to mention, you know, uh, before we start, that we've got some merch that you probably want to pick up. It's the Christmas season. You probably got some lovely Christmas monies. <laughs> Why are you didn't doing you? this strange baby? Got some voice. Christmas money. <laughs> so you should get some Skiggy's <laughs> merch. Uh, and my question before we start the show if you're listening on the audio version, head over to YouTube and leave your answer in the comments. What was your favorite episodes of Psy Guys from 2021? Ooh. I was going to say Stanford Prison Experiment, then I realized that was, that's, what, that's that was all, episode that's, 20. That was you're not meant to answer. No. This week, we're taking a walk down memory lane with our very special memory machine. <gasps> memory machine. Ooh, Luke was imitating a walk there. Yeah, so you may remember that last year we used a time machine to travel back through 2020, and we visited all of the best bits from that year. Do you remember that? Mm. Yes. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and well, this year, I, I don't have the time machine, I'm afraid. Ah, uh, uh, blimey. It, it we're doing broke. the next best thing. Remembering. We've got a memory machine. So I've got some, I've got the memory <gasps> machine here for you. Now, oh. while these may look, taste, smell, sound, feel, and anything else you want exactly like three Psy Guys pin badges, uh, which you can get from our store, normalcitizen.store, um, it's actually a memory machine. We're selling memory machines. No, 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 no. These no. look exactly oh, like the pin badges I that you can see. get from the normal citizen shore, store, but this is actually a memory machine. Do wow. not be deceived. This, yes. This, these are the memory machines. These are the memory yes. machines. Yes. yes. So all we need to do <laughs> is put these on mm. and we'll all be able to experience all of our memories, <gasps> our best memories from the past year of Psy Guys together. It's kind of like a pensive, but a lot less unwieldy. All right, it's on. I'm going to pop this one. Just on my forehead, over he- on my head here. I'm gonna join you. You're gonna That's pop great. it. Perfect. There you go. There we go. On yes. my head. Yes, I'm ready. Fantastic. Okay, so get ready to remember all of the best bits of Psy Guys Ooh. from the past year together. Ooh. Here we go. I can't oh, wait. Remembering so hard. Ah! Another key point is attention. So you need to be paying attention to commit something to memory. So you experience lots of things at once, but your brain will filter them out. Uh, for example, here's uh, here's a little question for you. Um, what color are my glasses? Ready uh, brown. Gotti. Gotti. Black. <laughs> Ready brown. <laughs> Some tint of gold. God. Well, okay. Are they black? What's interesting <gasps> oh, here no, I was... is that I have two pairs of glasses. I've been ah. wearing a black pair this entire time up until I asked you the question. <laughs> and you both, you both, oh. what you both did, what you both did is great because it's it's almost, it's showing almost an example of false memory here. You I guys myself. knew uh, from some other point that I I do have a pair of sort of goldish glasses. Yeah. But I don't wear those. I don't wear those for side guys. I haven't done for, for months. And I just saw you take them off. You just saw me take off my black glasses. Did oh well I'm I'm seeing through a webcam they look kind of red on this webcam for some reason I'm mate I'm looking at the it's because of the no, it's because of the purple in the room they look kind of like ready tinted I'm pretty sure they were I'm pretty sure I did take off the black ones because uh, I I actually did initially say black but then I doubted myself and I was like, <laughs> all I'm saying no. Corey is I do not know that you have I've not paid any attention to what glasses <laughs> color you wear so That's fine. it's only come from this now you image will. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally but my point As you here should. is my point here is that. You have been like, you, Jap, you've been looking at me this entire time, right? No. And you said, <laughs> almost this entire time. And you said, you said black initially, but then you changed it to a sort of ready brown because Luke almost ah, I influenced, influenced you, you with that. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. And so it's very easy to sort of. I doubted myself and then rushed into my head and I was like, what color are Corey's glasses? Right. And so they're usually gold. Yes. This is the idea right. that um, memories can sort of be influenced not only by someone saying something to you, but consciously, if your brain is like, so your sort of percep- perception of things, right? Mm. It, that's influenced by what your brain thinks you should be perceiving. Mm. 
So if you see my glasses and you're like, and your brain's like, well, I know that Corey's glasses are usually like sort of ready gold. So I probably did see ready gold glasses. Yeah. That, that your brain sort of tricks itself into thinking things that it, it thinks should be true. Yeah. And here's another one for you. Um, which direction does the fe- the queen face on a coin? Oh no. Left. 50, 50 chance. It's left, isn't it? You both said left. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if you can see this. You could maybe put it on. Stop screen. it. Is right. she getting right? No. She faces oh. right. She's facing Wait. right. Yeah. On every coin. Maybe. I don't know. On a two pence coin, she faces right. But my point here is that how often have you guys looked at coins? Well, quite frequently. Right? Yeah. And still, you don't know what direction the queen faces. She is facing right on every coin. Every single coin. What the flip? Mad, right? Turn round. Do you know how netball um, is a game that was made because someone misinterpreted the rules of basketball? (laughs) (laughs) Are you aware of that? I was not, but it does make sense. So what I heard was apparently... Uh, someone mis- someone was sent all the rules for basketball. A PE teacher was sent the rules for basketball along with suggestions on how where to place players. Um, and the person took that as the players have to stay in these quadrants, uh, which is why in netball, some players are only allowed to stay in particular parts. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I did uh, wonder why, how you could confuse basketball because you'd watch them running about and you'd go, yeah. <laughs> well, they, they have to stand still. Yeah, once they get the ball, they have to... Not move. Yeah. Yeah. But in netball, you're right. not, apparently, I think they're not allowed to leave certain areas if they're certain players. I've never played netball because I wasn't a girl in school. Hey, so I played wait. netball at school. I was really? on the school I? team. Yeah. Really? On the school team. Oh, wow. yeah. I was, I was wing attack. I was very good. I think I they definitely wouldn't have let boys on the school team at my school, but I did play it. I Honestly, I've never known a school to have boys play netball. I was the only boy. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> legend. That's so cool. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, is it? I think so. Yeah, it's no, not it's cool, cool by the standards that you would have been <laughs> judged upon in school, but by now standards, it's really cool. I didn't think that would come up. So that actually brings me quite comfortably on to our next element. If everyone can pull out their interactive parts for this episode, Ooh. please. Now, Corey, I've been looking at this the entire time we're doing this episode, and I think I figured out what it is. Yes. I think it's one of those pills that makes everything taste sweet. No, well, yes, kind of. Yes. yes. So uh, I was this is not told about this. Luke, have you got your? Have we all got our lemons as well? I need to get my lemon. One second. Okay, go grab your lemon, Luke. Are you gonna make us chomp into a lemon? Yes. Okay. Um. So this is from the Miracle Fruit. Um. And I'll tell you more about it once we've um once we've you know got into it. So this is great. There was a whole like was not wave of YouTube challenges about this back in the day. So good. I've never done it though. I've so never done it. What I need for you guys to do is this is this is very pretty straightforward, but um, it's very easy to mess up. Um, we're gonna have to sit here with these on our tongues until they dissolve. Oh you no! You need to let them dissolve on your tongues. There you go. It doesn't taste of much. No. Do I need to chop mm. my my lemon? Uh huh. Chop your lemon. Chop my lemon. It tastes okay. A lot like nothing. Well, this is gonna be five minutes of great content. So, nope. the thing is, <laughs> apparently it doesn't taste for much. It's like cranberry, but mm. less flavorful. Yeah, yeah and cranberry. Uh-huh. <laughs> cranberry. This is, a, this is an extract oh. from a fruit, is it not, Chloe? Yeah, it's an extract from Finistalum dulcifum. I'm getting hints of cranberry. Uh-huh. Mm. Miracle fruit or miracle berry is a tropical fruit that temporarily changes the sense of taste and makes sour or bitter foods mm. and drinks taste free. Yeah. So how about that? Just sit and let it dissolve for a little bit, and I'll keep on talking. Okay. <laughs> it's a web berry that is native to West Africa, and was first described in seventeen twenty-five. <laughs> I'm just thinking about the poor person who has to do the subtitles. I was just for thinking our, that. A podcast. I will send them a fan script. <laughs> okay. I'm okay. sorry, my wolf. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very hard to talk without using your tongue. <laughs> I've got it with quite a sense, Phil. If anything, okay, I've cut my lemon in half. How long do you need oh, yeah. to wait for this? 
Uh, just wait till it's dissolved a little bit on your tongue. Once you've got it like good and dissolved on there, it should be fine. I think I I think it's dissolved on my tongue. Mm, pretty much dissolved. As mine. everyone else, yeah, it's dissolved on mine. Mm -hmm. Yep. All, all good to go. Yeah. And see if this actually works. So, three, two, one. Oh my. Oh oh wow. That tastes so good. Oh my that god. That is Whoa. so delicious. Oh wow. Mm. I'm going to eat the whole lemon. I'm going to get some more lemon. I'm honestly going to eat it all. Mm. It mm. adds like a caramelly texture to it, doesn't it? Like mm. a strange... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Mm. So I'm, I'm still getting... It's strange. I'm still getting like a tiny little bit of sour in some parts of my tongue. I can still sense the sourness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. but I think that's probably because we... You and I have taken half a tablet each. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of rushed it. But wow... Like, I'm really just tasting sweet here. It's so... That's mm. really strange. I'm trying to work out how to describe that. It's kind of like... Have you ever... It's like a lemon-flavored sweet where they've put in a lot of sugar. What else can we eat that we shouldn't? <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm looking around my desk now. So what apparently it can actually make um, sweeter... Sweet foods taste sweeter. <gasps> Chocolate oh. time! But... <laughs> So imagine, imagine if you're an American that's used to American chocolate, tasting English chocolate, and then taking one of these. Thank you. Do you know, my, this is the thing, right? Um, <laughs> looking at this lemon, my body is saying, do not, do not bite this. It will be bad for you. And then mm -hmm. I lick it. Both times I'm like, no, that's, that's oh. wrong. Mm. My lips mm. are covered in lemon juice and it's sore. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'm so, do you know what? I, I'm, <laughs> to everyone watching... I genuinely recommend if you can afford to go and get one of these, um, some of these pills. This is amazing. I didn't know these existed before yeah. you brought them in. Fantastic. So there is this thing called flavor tripping, and people have parties where they just they get they get these um, tablets, they sprinkle it on their tongue, and they start tasting things because what this does is it actually it changes the taste of um, sour things and makes them taste sweet. And again, also some people say it can make sweet things taste sweeter. So it won't affect other tastes, but sour things will become sweet. So lemons and limes, um, you'll suddenly start tasting sweetness instead of instead of that sour. So good. I hear people say it all the time where they're like, I'm not going veggie or vegan until the substitutes look and taste exactly like what I'm used to. <laughs> um, so yeah. entitled. Yeah, right? <laughs> and until, I, until I can't distinguish it from actual chicken or actual beef, then yeah. I will not, not be vegan it. until I'm vegan accidentally and I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. Until I don't have to notice it. Here's the thing, yeah. right? If, you, if, you're thinking, if you're thinking like, oh, I don't want to be vegan because um, I would miss meat too much, I promise you, you will feel that for a, you'll feel that for a few months. I had the mm -hmm. meat dreams for a, a few months. <laughs> The, I had the meat dreams. You had the meat dreams. Mm -hmm. It's like actual what? cravings as well. Meat dreams? Did you have that? Did you, you have, have that? No. You had the meat dreams? Really? No. I had dreams about meat. I had I dreamt about eating particular kinds of meat. Yeah. Sometimes I still dream uh, I still dream about someone offering me meat and I eat it and I'm like, oh no. <sighs> I need to rationalize it myself. myself. And then I wake up <laughs> and I'm like, oh wait, no. It's fine. I didn't actually do it. Oh, good. Did um, you guys ever have the like worry that you would like eat meat when you were drunk or something? Because I had that, but I never did. There I did was at never the beginning, a, like, and then I never did. I even had it offered, like offered to me mm. when I was drunk. Yeah, I, like, I don't know why. Like my brain would think that I would do that, but I would never. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I mean, look, that's the thing. Uh, people that are not vegan would want meat to be sort of, uh, um, if, like vegan meat to be as meaty as possible. But here's the thing: you will forget what meat is like. Like th this happens now, where I get an honest burger and I I bite into it. And I'm like, did they give me a meat one? And then yeah. I, I take it to someone. I'm like, hey, can you try this and tell me if it's meat? And they're like, this is obviously not meat. And I'm like, it's been years. <laughs> it's literally, I have not had meat for like half a decade. I genuinely don't remember what it is like enough to discern fake meat from real meat. Yeah. Whereas someone that is eating meat regularly is like, yeah, okay, of course. <laughs> Of course, that's different. I will buy. I will buy something from like the veggie section, like fully only veggie section. I will like start to cook it, and then I will have to like pick up the packaging from the trash and be like, "Wait, yeah." <laughs> like, so for some reason, it's still this like in my mind that I'm like somehow I got the wrong packaging and this is the wrong thing, but it's probably not even close. This is what's interesting. I think that when you really look into a lot of different religions, I. This is this is why this is one reason that I guess I'm not religious, but I would say sometimes I really wish I could be. 
because I, I I don't <laughs> think I physically have it in me. I don't think I could believe in any of this stuff. Mm. Like, I feel like on some level, I'd be kind of being like, okay, come on, just pretend. Um, and I like, I genuinely don't think I can. Something would have to change in, in me or in my life to make me be feel like actually able to do it. But the sort of um, similarity I see in all of these religions is that they are kind of just different lenses of viewing the world. And you can see similarities between sort of prayers and magic in sort of manifesting through um, intent or belief, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And I find that really interesting that regardless of sort of where you look uh, through different religions, um, there is, there is sort of the the through line of don't harm other people and you can change, um, you can sort of change your life or you can affect the world through positive intent. Um, I, I, yeah, I just find I just find that really interesting. When you say you you don't think you could ever be religious, do you think you could be spiritual? <sighs> nah. Well, really interesting. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Look, I'll, I'll get into I'll get into why this is a science. This is a science podcast in a sec. I was going <laughs> to say, uh, what would, what would it mean to be spiritual and not religious? Um, so, well, I think spirituality is finding your own truth and religion is ascribing to a truth that is given to you to a certain extent. And the, that doesn't mean that the, okay. the two are incompatible. You can yeah. be religious and also find your own truth within the religion. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think that religions can be like science can come along and can debunk specific parts of your religion. Yeah. And if it, if you're not spiritual underneath your religiousness, you know, like you could be, you could have every single part of the Bible scientifically be debunked and yet yeah. still believe that there is a truth beyond your five or six or seven or whatever mm. human limited senses. So spirituality is almost like humbleness to me, which is the yeah. idea that like, okay, I literally have no idea. I don't know what the world's made of. I don't know how I came to be. I don't know anything. And so it's like, uh, it's to me, it's like the, it's being humble. Whereas, um, whereas religion is like the idea that you do know the truth in my definition of it. It's like, mm-hmm. this is actually the truth. Um, and if you don't believe this truth, then you have in some way sinned. Um, or at least that's the truth I was given through my religion. <laughs> <laughs> I think at its most fundamental, Jamp, spirituality is just the belief that that you are not um, confined to your physical body. So if your physical mm-hmm. body is destroyed, the the continuum of experience does not cease. Yeah. Whereas religion is like, these are the rules mm. um, to a certain extent, generally. I mean, that's, again, I was brought up in a religion. And so my definition of religion is yeah. very related to the religion I was brought up into. I'm sure there are much less dogmatic religions. Yeah. Um, yeah. And to be fair, when I say I'm, I'm not spiritual, that's not to say that, oh, I think you, you don't need, to, when someone says they're not spiritual, that doesn't necessarily mean they believe they know everything. Yeah. In, in my case, I know I don't know anything, <laughs> but I've, I, I don't yeah. want to, I, I would not want to use my energy acting on things that I'm not certain of. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense, I'd, I'd like yeah. to have a degree of certainty before doing anything. Yeah. What I meant by that was, I I have a belief, for example, that there are things that cannot be known. Absolutely. And and so, um, whereas that would be a, a bit of a blow to 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 science, um, if if it, I mean, it, it, I'm sure it does uh, stay open to the idea that it cannot be known that that it can't be. But we base our entire society around science at the moment. Um, and so, or like it's, it has a strong, it has the impact on our world that the church used to have. And so if science um, were not actually able to eventually discover the ultimate truth, um, then that would sort of make its pedestal a little bit more crumbly. I disagree. Um, I think we've had conversations like this before. And I think the, I think the belief that science um, is searching for an absolute truth, um, I think when scientists and people that sort of are interested in science have that view of it, have that view that science is searching for an ultimate truth and that mm. the ultimate truth is possible to find. I think to me, at least that's a misunderstanding of what science is. I think the reason that science has its place in society right now is because it is currently really one of the most reliable methods for understanding the world. If you look, if you sort of think of, um, religion and different kind of spirituality and science always being similar in that they're different lenses through which to view the world. Yeah. I would say that, at least in my opinion, science thus far 
is fairly reliable yeah. and where it, and and in in its ability to change and i don't think that i don't think that there needs to be an an end point in sight for science to be um for science to continue being the sort of um power that it is in fact i think believing that there is an end point there is an end point there is a point where we will have all of the knowledge and will no longer need to search <laughs> i i think that um pack your bags scientists yeah I, out. I don't know i just feel like that uh, I don't think that really messes with science because there are you all to be to be a good scientist, you always need to be asking more questions. And the belief that there will be some point where all the questions have been answered, that just seems to me as to be unrealistic and yeah. not within the sort of um not within the sort of realm of the way that science works. We'll always have questions. Exactly. Uh, there's a really good quote that I think sums up what you're saying. I, I agree that I have a belief that that is what science is and it might actually be what science is. Um, but there's a quote that re that reminded me of, which I have seen separately attributed to Galileo and Brecht. So I'm not sure who said it. It will be, sorry, I, I do know, I will know the answer to this probably. Uh, this will likely be attributed to Galileo because Bertolt Brecht did a play uh, called, Galileo, uh, called Galileo about Galileo. So it, oh. it will likely be the character Galileo in the play written by Brecht. Go on. Interesting. Do you know the quote? Um, you'll say it and I'll be able to remember it, but I, I don't know off the top of my head. It is, the aim of science is not to open the door to infinite wisdom, but to set a limit on infinite error. Very good. Interesting. That sounds like kind of what you're saying. Bloody love Brecht, man. I love a little bit good. of Brecht. And so let's say you're, you're, casting a, you're, you're casting a spell for, say, whatever thing to happen. If you've got if you know that your spells, if you've got the positivity, the sort of positive outlook that your spells will aid you in your life, yeah, then it, you're more likely, it, it would seem to be an optimist, if that yeah. makes sense, or to be defined as an optimist because you have this sort of positive outlook. You think that um, sort of, you think you expect good things to happen. If you perform a, a spell um, wanting good things to happen, then you're likely to expect good things to happen. <gasps> and if it doesn't work, it's because you don't expect good things to happen. And that falls very uh, much in line with the um, the sort of the manifestation, the idea yeah. that like, like attracts like. You see? I just realized that also, if you <laughs> cast a spell intending for something bad to happen and you also believe that it will return to you threefold, then you'll become a pessimist mm. and your life will actually get worse. Yeah, absolutely. Because you'll be like, three things that are bad are going to happen to me now. Well, not necessarily oh. three things, something three times worse. Three times yeah. as bad, yeah. yes. Yeah. No, it's, 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 uh, it's brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, and this is, this is why I wanted to bring this up, because I find it really interesting. And I feel like people kind of write this stuff off. So you can either, there are different ways of viewing it. Like my way of viewing it, my personal way of viewing this, is that, um, as I've said before, religions, different kinds of spirituality, science, they're all similar to each other. They're all, we all kind of view them as kind of, we kind of view them in the same box mm. because they are all different ways of um, understanding our, like the world around us. Yeah. The way that I choose to do it is generally science because to me that makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. But when we look at similar things, we, we explain them in slightly different ways. So science would explain the sort of like attracts like that rule of attraction, the law of attraction um, and the idea of manifestation in the optimism bias. Yeah, and the fact that optimists tend to experience a better world because they expect uh, they expect better things. That's how science would explain it. But um, Wicca would explain that as the law of attraction and manifestation. Interesting. And so neither one is necessarily more correct than the other because they're both describing the same thing. Mm -hmm. And sure, I think with some religions there comes there comes the, the issue with religions often is that they explain things incorrectly if that makes sense they're yeah. not consistent with um they're not consistent with sort of the world around us but in this instance at least wicca seems to be consistent at least if you want to view it in a, a slightly if you want to uh view it in a certain way you could say that this explains why those sort of spells work to an extent so the way i've always wondered about um the law of attraction is the idea that so for example if you um think about the actual real limited ability you have to control your own body mm. and to control your own mind. Like you can't choose the emotions you feel. 
you can't choose, or maybe you can, but you can't control the emotions as they come up necessarily. They just come up. You don't choose to have the thoughts you have. They just they just appear. Um, and what I wondered is if like if that suggests that like the actual part of us, like our conscious self, the individual that we believe ourselves to be, mm -hmm. um, is only a part of what's of the software that's running on our brain. If we can sort of pass. Um, a request through to the subconscious mind, um, then the subconscious mind can execute on that in ways that we don't necessarily understand. Mm. And so we will spot opportunities, not because um, they necessarily m came about out of nowhere, but because our subconscious mind is spot is looking for those opportunities. And, and, and if we weren't looking for those opportunities, they would just get filtered out and you wouldn't spot them. Yeah, well, because what you spot is not actually your choice. It happens subconsciously. So this is actually interesting. You kind of brought us a little bit onto the attentional bias, which I'll, I'll really, that, like, that's a great point. I'm very astute because you you genuinely have almost hit the nail entirely on the head there. Um, so the attentional bias is essentially, um, kind of it kind of describes like the fact that we, we usually will focus on certain things more than others. Obviously, your attention is limited. It's finite. Yeah. It, it, you cannot you cannot focus on everything at once, and so you're kind of you kind of subconsciously decide what your attention needs to be focused on. Now, there is an issue there because what decides what you focus on? You know, like how do you decide what to focus on? Mm -hmm. And because that's subconscious, you can't really control it, as Luke said. So the attention bi bias is kind of is kind of the idea that. Um, certain things will affect um, what we are able to sort of like notice or pay attention to. Yeah. So uh, an easy example, one that's often used is hunger. If you're hungry, you're going to notice food more than other things, mm, right? Yeah. Um, or like this is often in anxiety as well and depression in yeah. that um, if you're depressed, you start to notice things that make you more depressed. If you're anxious, you'll start to think, notice things that trigger anxiety more. Uh, Essentially, um, different stimuli will um, affect what you are more likely to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And where I think this comes into Wicca is that, um, or, at least, or sort of witchcraft and uh, magic and spells, is that if your attention is focused, for example, to um, specific outcomes, let's say you've cast a spell um, to, uh, I guess, um, I don't know, for wealth. I, again, this pulling this off the top of my head. Yeah. You're probably more likely to notice notice sort of um, surprise income or notice a coin on the ground or something along those lines. Do you know what I mean? Yes. In that there is this subconscious that you that you, you can't necessarily specifically control, but you almost can control it by casting a spell because you kind of have then implanted kind that in your subconscious. Kind of makes it extra attentive. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. In the same way that sort of um, anxiety... Uh, in the people that have anxiety, you can often like they can often be more uh, sort of more uh, responsive to anxiety triggers. Like, pay mm -hmm. more attention to anxiety triggers. Yeah. Um, by casting a spell, you could then be making yourself more attentive to the things that you want to be more attentive to. And I just think it's really interesting that this is this is not something. This is not me saying. Ah, oh, yes, yeah, science ex has explained a way. Uh, no, this is saying that at least from what I've gathered. What like these sort of uh, these sort of practices of magic? Yeah, they do have some kind of scientific basis. You can't say, "Oh, that's mm. absolutely rubbish," because there is a lot that we don't understand about ourselves. And in fact, I was reading this fantastic book about um, uh, about sort of, and it's linked in the description. Uh, this fantastic book about uh, the subconscious mind, essentially, um, and how there's so much going on that you're entirely not aware of. Yeah, and I just I just find it really interesting that you could view this as Wicca almost, or witchcraft and magic, almost tapping into that subconscious mind and finding a way to direct it, you know? Interesting. What I really like about the way you're describing this, Corey, is that um, you're just giving a, a different explanation for the same phenomenon. Mm. Um, and it doesn't mean that one explanation is more valid than the other. Like the science explanation is basically like the nerdy explanation for the thing that religions have known for ages. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you're also correct that some religions had um, do have beliefs that turn out to be not true, and those are kind of like like baggage that they have picked up over the over the centuries, mm. like particular beliefs that our brains are um, potentially like uh, 
more likely like hacks in our brain that that might be picked up and and can carry on like um and those those are not only part of religion there are political beliefs that are um sort of they hook into your fear or that kind of thing and they get carried along through the centuries and uh, we have to kind of get rid of those things but i really like that the whole point of this is just here is an explanation for the same phenomena it doesn't actually matter necessarily the cause and effect relationship of how that manifests in the external world. Mm. Um, like this part of the brain passes it to this part of the brain or that kind of thing. Um, it just matters that the if you do these things, your conscious experience actually goes the way you want it to sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. That's cool. No, I think this is really interesting. And honestly, I could I struggle to find studies on this and I think more studies should be done on this. And what's really what's really interesting to me about this is that I think that, as I've said already, uh, the reason that science is sort of my way, my lens through which um, I view the world is because I feel it's the most reliable. However, I feel like a lot of people that um, also use science as a lens uh, through which to view, to view the world um, restrict their view by right. only choosing to look through that lens. They almost have tunnel vision um, in that they would say, oh, well, Wicca, it's not science. Therefore, <laughs> all rubbish right? <laughs> Witchcraft, sure that. nah, not listening to that because it, there's no scientific evidence for it. However, the, the thing is what you said there about their, the things that religions or um, different sort of spirituality, uh, they've, they've known about for a long, long time. And there is this sort of like, there is there are some instances of sort of folk psychology or like folk knowledge that um, when studied turns out to be true for some reason or another. And I think this is almost an example of that in that there is this sort of thing that has been known in, uh, there's this thing that's been known in sort of witchcraft for a long, long time. And that like, if you think good stuff, good stuff will happen. Um, and it, it doesn't need to go any farther than that. You know, there doesn't need to be a, well, why does this happen? Because really all that, all that matters for us is our experiences is the outcome. If we know that, yeah. if we know that think good, good happen, then you don't need to know why good happened. You just need to know think good, good <laughs> happen. I'm done. And I think I think here's the thing. I think that a lot of a lot of people, um, in specifically scientists um, or people that sort of believe heavily in science, would do well to open their mind slightly to the possibilities of other things because it, one, it opens up more opportunities for study. But two, also, this could really improve your life. You know, yeah. like feeling like, um, you know, understanding the idea that. Um, feeling good about stuff or focusing on trying to focus on the positive can actually have a positive impact on your subjective experience. It, this is the thing. It may not, and this is what I'm saying here, is that it may not be that these spells actually have um, uh, an impact on the world in that they don't necessarily change our reality. In fact, I would say that plenty of, uh, plenty of uh, sort of magic users, uh, witches, um, Wiccans, may agree with that, that there is no sort of fundamental changing of reality, but it, it alters your subjective experience. You don't necessarily need to alter, you don't need a spell to alter reality to change how you feel, you know, or to for it to work. You just need to change your subjective experience because really that's all that matters. What, mm -hmm. what literally actually happens is almost secondary to what you experience mm. because that's the lens through which you view everything. I fully agree. The first satellite uh, that was sent to space um, was the Soviet Union's Sputnik, and that was in 1957. Hmm. So it was only a few years later that we started trying to, well, I say we, when I say we, I mean the human race. Uh, so it was only about three years later that we started trying to leave our terrible, awful planet and go to a worse one. Um, were there attempts to go to space before Sputnik that failed? Uh, yeah, there were attempts to go to, I think there were attempts to go to space uh, that failed before Sputnik. But um, it was the, the, but the bear in mind the difference between getting something into orbit and getting something out of orbit and on the way to Mars is, it's a, it's, there's different considerations. It's quite a big mm -hmm. leap, mm -hmm. you know? Because getting something into orbit is essentially just shooting it up and making it fall right. Mm -hmm. you know fall so it misses the earth whereas when you Easy. when you leave the planet you've got to you've got to take into account guidance and how the planets are moving in re in sort of um in respect retrograde. to one another hmm? retrograde right yeah that's right retrograde. that's what you're gonna say <laughs> no 
No. Okay. <laughs> Suddenly an astrology. Um. So which which country was it that was trying to get to uh, Mars in the 60s? It was uh, the Soviet Union. So the USSR was trying to get there. Ah. Obviously, um, America was trying to do it as well because anything that the USSR does, America wants to do too. They want a piece of That's it. how the song goes, isn't it? Anything the USSR can do, the US can do better. The US can do anything the USSR can do. No, he can't. Yes, he can. <laughs> no, you can't. Yes, I can. And that's all of history. <laughs> that's the Cold War in one song. <laughs> Look, the one thing that the USSR did that the US doesn't want to do is communism. And that is a mm. fact you could take to the bank. The USSR didn't But dissolve. not in the USSR because um, they don't have banks. There. The USSR is still going. They just relocated to Mars. <laughs> They just they they was they succeeded. <laughs> I was thinking about this. No, I was honestly thinking about this. Um, I feel like there's bound to be a film about the Soviets going to Mars, like a proper Red Scare film, a Red Scare on the Red Planet. You know, <laughs> like I really and I want to see that. And if it doesn't exist, I want to make it. No, but I do think it's I do think it's really lovely the way that we treat the rovers. You know, like Curiosity had a Twitter account and Perseverance has got a Twitter account, and everyone loves Curiosity even though it's just essentially a robot. Well, not even necessarily a robot. Like, it, it's it's a rover, yeah. you know? But we all love it. Uh, there's also the UAE, United Arab Emirates. Um, so they've sent something up to Mars. Um, it's going to be, well, I'd say it's going to be in orbit. It arrived in orbit um, around about the 9th of February this year, 2021. Uh, so the idea is to get a good idea of the climate of Mars. Um, and basically give scientists um, a look into what the atmosphere uh, was like when it could have supported life. Wow. Why? <laughs> Just out of interest, why? <laughs> why not? I mean, it's, 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 it, I mean, you could ask why for all of this stuff. Why are we going to Mars? Why are we trying to find out if there was life on Mars? Because it's, it's interesting and it also gives us an insight to life on Earth. Uh, there's lots of reasons for it, but ultimately when it comes to science and going to space, why not? You know, because well, we can. I, I agree, but why, why, why look at? I mean, I understand that science doesn't necessarily have an, an a known application immediately, but why look at the climate when it could have maybe supported a thing that we don't know whether it did support yet? Um, you know it what I mean? It could help give us insight into whether it did support life or not. Ah, okay, it could give us a look into what happens, um, what happens when your planet supports life and then doesn't. There's lots mm. of reasons. There's there, there's plenty of applications um, for it. it. Well, I say plenty of applications. Plenty of reasons to look into it because it could give us better insight on other things. But Fair ultimately, enough. when it, like this is the thing. When it comes to going to space, it, it, like, it doesn't really matter. It could save the planet one day, but it's not super important to right now. And I feel like if we start asking the questions of like, oh, well, why are we doing this? Mm. Just because. I don't think we need to have a strong reason to do it. <laughs> going to Mars is cool. Yeah. Let's do that. I think. Start there. <laughs> Expand. Exactly. Just spread across the entire solar system like an awful, awful disease. Uh -huh. Here's a fun, interesting fact that I found out um, recently. Now, do you know the feeling of sort of suffocating? The feeling of um, not being able to breathe when you breathe in? Uh, like, yes. Yeah, that doesn't come from not breathing in oxygen. That comes from breathing in carbon dioxide. I too ah. have been watching Tank Green's TikTok. Actually, I saw it on his Instagram. So uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but um, yeah. So breathing in helium or whatever, you won't you won't feel like you're suffocating. Uh, breathing in carbon monoxide, you won't feel like you're suffocating necessarily. Uh, but carbon dioxide, oh boy, that's that's that one's gonna get you. So if you go to Mars, you're gonna basically feel like you're suffocating the whole time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So the point I mean, of you that will be suffocating the whole time. You so. have this you yes. don't have a sense of low oxygen. You have a sense of carbon dioxide concentration. Yeah, you've got a sense of carbon dioxide uh, concentration being too high. Yeah. Interesting. Weird, isn't it? Weird that we wouldn't yeah. have evolved uh, the ability to know the concentration of oxygen in our blood, seeing as that's the thing we need. Ah, but that's not that's not so much the issue. Like, we, well, I mean, okay, that's not so much the issue. The thing is, it's interesting because it, it really, to me, it points to that whole thing of evolution just solves the problem that it needs to, at the time, in the easiest way, that, not necessarily the easiest way, in whatever way works, mm -hmm. you know? Right. So, like, the human You're eye... Right, that is not the issue, because it's it's the amount of... It's you needing to breathe out con uh, carbon dioxide that's the problem, isn't it? Well, no... You need to expel it. What I mean is that um, 
so the issue is sort of the issue is if you don't if you don't breathe enough oxygen you suffocate but if you breathe oxygen then you breathe out carbon dioxide and generally if you're breathing if there's low oxygen there's going to be too much carbon dioxide because you're breathing all of the mm. oxygen right so if you've got a sense for there being too much carbon dioxide then y most cases that's going to be a pretty good sense for how much oxygen there is right yeah so yeah why would you why would you need to evolve something different it's like the human eye it's, it can't see all of the colors like it can't, it can't discern between you know as many colors as other animals necessarily can it's not even the best configuration for seeing stuff we've made better things for seeing stuff than it, than the human yeah. eye but it works so it's fine it's fine yeah yeah it'll do. It doesn't let you see the ghosts though so <laughs> try next time evolution <laughs> <laughs>
in terms of how we view um, space exploration. I don't like that it is each country for themselves, or in the case of Europe, the, each Europe from for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I just feel like we should. It's something we should be doing as a planet, surely, right? Like, okay, in this in this case, competition doesn't necessarily help. Collaboration surely would be better, <laughs> right? Yes, but even the thing, even the things that we do on this earth as uh, supposedly collaborating, like America and the UK broke all sorts of international laws to invade Iraq. Mm. Like, and they did that openly. They knew what they were doing. They tried to bribe a bunch of um, dip diplomats and politicians into, into hiding it or into voting for it because they, like there's, this is all well documented. These things are, when, it, when, it, when a country really wants to do something, well, when America really wants to do something, it just goes, <laughs> it just ignores these laws and goes, right, well, what are you going to do? Your, all of your currencies are based on our currency. What are you actually going to do? Nothing. And so it, there'll be a, probably a short amount of time in which the whichever country gets to Mars first that you know will be affected by the the Earth's politics. Like if the U, if the US gets up to Mars and colonizes it, um, then that can it can still be heavily influenced by Earth politics because if they do certain things on Mars, well, the EU can hit back at them on Earth, or mm. China can hit back at them on Earth, and mm -hmm. they can spy on them because there are like you say, Chinese satellites on Earth uh, on um, Mars, um, but in the long run, it's it's just who who friggin' knows? It's insane. It's like it probably will become its own own state in the way that we have, yeah. like it will become a different planet with a different system. Maybe it will become a republic. Maybe it will be actually uni like start off um, like united because there's only one person running it. It's like this is such unprecedented territory. It's fascinating yeah it's interesting though i think this is the issue that i've got with it i think um that like i said we're all very divided but why does it need to be people from one country being sent up to lay state sort of lay claim to it you know surely it, well just because the funding that's where the funding comes from mm. the funding comes from governments I mean, it won't be if it's SpaceX. It's a private company. They can do what they like. Which is worse in a way, you know? Which is... A I, company will be the government of Mars. Yeah, and like that would set a, a, an awful precedent of a company becoming a, a country, yeah, essentially. A yeah, but that's body. what Britain was for a while, wasn't it? It was the, the East India Company was like basically Britain. Um, like, True. what is the difference? Ultimately, what is the difference between a company and a country? There isn't... There is like superficial differences. Mm. Companies are enshrined by countries, but... They're all just fake things we make up in order to collaborate and in order to manipulate each other. Like they're not they're not real things. Like no, in order I, to like I know they're not to real organize. things. Sorry, the, the 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 positive way of looking at that is they're all things that we make up in order to um in order to organize and in order to have a story that makes sense. Um, because n nobody working for Apple, for example, actually they just do stuff and agree that they all work for Apple and they just, and then that works. <laughs> yeah, no, None I None of us are, I, like, it's all made up. That's so. like, that is, yeah, that, I know it's all made up and that's exactly my <laughs> issue with it, right? Because it's all made up and if it's all made up in the service of good, then great. Like, you know, money is made up. Money is a, is a fake thing that doesn't actually exist and if you think it does exist, don't be silly. Don't be silly. Money isn't real. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, like, don't, the amount of times I said that to people and they've been like, no, stop it. Stop it. Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> it's not real. Look, okay, right. Especially, right. Money isn't real for one thing, right? But also, when when you get to like sort of digital money, it's just numbers in a bank. It do, it's not real. It doesn't. Yeah. Like, what, well, that what, depends on your definition of real. Okay, real Sorry, in the sense but it that does. it's not. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's not real in the sense that if we all agreed tomorrow that money, like, you know, that money wasn't worth anything anymore. Money wouldn't be worth anything anymore. If we all agreed... Sure, but in, that's a hypothetical because we wouldn't ever all agree if, on it. If we agreed... Okay, right, yeah. But, <laughs> but if, if there was did. like... Um, the thing is, if enough of us agree... If enough of us if agreed... you could zap the brains of every person, mm. then yes, it would stop okay, existing. No, if we, if, 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 and a house wouldn't. No, if enough of us agreed in two weeks' time, right, that um, that money just was worth more, right? That all, of, that all of the money in the world was worth more money, then it would be worth more. If we all agreed well, in a few months' time that though that money was worth less it would be not all of us but enough of us you know if if a certain amount of us agreed that it would be threshold. worth less mm -hmm. if in a, a year's time we all agreed that there was um 
there were there was more gold on the planet that would literally not change the amount of gold that sure. is on the planet yes but so that's what you mean by real yeah what i mean by real is that it, it like it is a social it's a piece construct. of software running on the brain yeah it's a social yeah. construct it's a it's an agreement that we all have with each other and i think the issue is and the same with countries they're all just agreements mm. that we have with each other that this thing exists or at least we'll pretend this thing exists um for convenience sake uh mm. but i think the issue is that when we start like actually believing that these things are really things that exist and in a situation wherein surely it would be better to realize ah yes the the lines that we draw up on our the lines that we draw the pretend lines that we draw up on drawings of our planet are a <laughs> bit silly and are limiting us maybe we should work together and help the human race as a whole you know like when it starts to get to that point where like countries are getting in the way of that then like get rid of them don't you don't need to think about countries they're they're, they're fake you know? But my country's the best. It's not. Go to Mars. Make a new one. <laughs> it's just, it, it, it frustrates me, the the competition that we see um, in space exploration. It, it frustrates me that um, a private company is is doing it for some reason. Money, the prob probably. But the problem is with what you say there, Corey, <laughs> is there is literally zero evidence that human beings can actually organize without effective stories. Mm. That the stories we tell ourselves are not real in mm. the physical sense. Um, we don't have any evidence that that human beings can operate in such a condition. So, like that's there's a one specific part of your brain and functioning that is that is saying that and is thinking that, and it's sort of going against the other part of the brain, which goes, "I need a story to make sense of the world." Um, and <laughs> I don't know. It might. It, it, we have no evidence that it works. Think, it's purely unscientific to say, like we not not that you're being unscientific, but it's like it's not tested. Is what I mean. No, what, what I mean. What I mean is not, like okay. So I don't think that the stories need to go. I think that countries are fine. I don't like. I don't think it's. I don't think that it's bad. I don't think it's bad to support your football team, even though a football team doesn't exist. They all just wear the same colors and say that they're the same team. You could literally <laughs> swap all of the players from one football team to another, and people would still support the ones that are wearing the color that they like best. Yeah. Um, ridiculous, right? My point is not that they shouldn't exist at all. My point is more that I think we need to recognize that they are just kind of stories that we tell ourselves. They're not things that actually mean anything. Like what specific part of the planet you were born on um, doesn't really matter very much, hugely. Obviously the culture and whatnot, the culture and experience that comes with that um, is important and it can help It can help sort of differentiate you from others. But ultimately my point here is that countries, the, the concept of countries and the concept of money and whatnot, it's all very helpful for a lot of things, but it is limited. And believing that it is not limited leads to issues. And in this is, this is one of the cases where I think it is terrifically limiting and we mm. need to recognize that it's just a story that we all agree to. We don't need to agree to it all the time. But then how will you control the population, Corey? <laughs> <laughs> This week we finally come to the topic of coming. <laughs> what? I, I beg your pardon. <laughs> Dirty patrons. <laughs> Dirty patrons. This is what they, this is what they for voted this. for. They voted for. So it was a tie. It was the <laughs> science of orgasms or the science of PTSD. And I thought one of them seemed a little bit dark, so I went with orgasms instead. Did someone just oh. like submit like come please? <laughs> <laughs> please, please just come. Signs of come. Signs, Signs of, of come. come. Maybe maybe uh, for this week's this month's bonus episode. Which you can get on patreon.com forward slash sci guys. A bonus episode about cum. It'll just be called cum. Besides <laughs> cum. slash. <laughs> no, but I thought bandits. that we could uh, bang this one out uh, pretty quickly. So I uh -huh. thought we'd. Oh. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> 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 I thought we'd <laughs> do the science of orgasms. So why don't we dive right in? Shall we? <laughs> no. Let's dive straight into the cum. <laughs> <laughs> <That's kind of laughs> <deep>. Yeah. <laughs> right. This is the thing. To anyone who's a new listener, we do often talk about science topics, and yeah. we're not usually this childish. Last I thought week you were going to say, right we do bat. talk about cum. <laughs> <laughs> last week we talked about going to Mars. Now <laughs> yeah. we're talking about cum. I mean, our 100th episode was, was just last week. It's 101. You know, we reached the climax, and now we're finally coming. <laughs> I don't like puns. I don't like when How you many make of these puns. have you got, Curry? <laughs> um, <laughs> honestly, Luke, I've got a few, but it takes me a little bit uh, between each one to get back to. Anyway. <laughs> 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 Or 
orgasm, also called climax, climactic psych- uh, psychological, st- uh, physiological state of heightened sexual excitement and gratification mm. that is followed by a relaxation of sexual tensions and the body's muscles. Essentially, um, it's that bit at the end of sex, uh, not necessarily at the end of sex, but usually at the end of sex, where you mm. feel all good and start relaxing. It is like the big goal of sex, isn't it? What? Well, you know what? No. No. Baby is goal and make love secondary. Well, you don't go for a baby every time. <laughs> Come is not important. You don't, you don't go for a baby every time, do you? Usually no. you go for an orgasm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> this has got really weird. <laughs> you probably want both, I guess, if you're looking for a baby. You know? Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah. If. Yeah, if. Yeah. I did if like that Noah said orgasm. within about 10 seconds of each other, baby is the goal, come is not important. <laughs> 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 well, if baby is the goal... <laughs> I didn't think about that. <laughs> Very good. Very receptive. <laughs> to anyone who doesn't understand... Come make baby. We did an episode on it. But you don't actually have to. Sex. You don't have to orgasm to get someone pregnant. You cut. Yeah. That's sometimes true. the pre cum is enough. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes mm. the pre cum is enough, but also yeah. you don't necessarily need to orgasm to ejaculate. Some people can ejaculate without orgasm. Or what? Some people can orgasm. What? Just like dribble, without eja- uh, dribble uh, out. Like, it's like a gun shooting without you pulling the trigger. Well, you could throw a bullet at someone real fast, can't <laughs> wow. yeah, you? Yeah. you'd be <laughs> like, "Whoa, what's going on?" <laughs> you take out the bullet and you throw it. <laughs> like boom. Chucking bullet. No, you're just holding the gun and the bullet falls out. <laughs> 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 I saw a TikTok oh. about this recently about like, um, what's it called? It's called like, uh, I think the the term that people use online is like post-nut clarity. That's yes. It. Yeah. Um, yes. Which yeah. is like this idea that, um, well, the, the idea goes that uh, typically men will find uh, their partner um, less attractive post-orgasm. And, no. you, and the, I've read about there's like a, something to do with like a, a kind of repulsion um, like an instinct towards repulsion unless there's some kind of like um you know bond like you you care about the person um but i don't know i mean i i don't i don't get that i just want to cuddle <laughs> <laughs> when i said ick i meant like oh why did i do that not oh my god you're so much uglier than you were 10 <laughs> seconds ago you guys are you guys are kind of talking about two different but yeah um, <laughs> semi potentially things. related things yeah. um right look you, you seem to be talking about sex with another person um Right. No, I assume you're talking about masturbating to porn. No. What? No. no. I'm just saying in general. <laughs> right. Okay. Afterwards, you're a bit like, oh, that was a bit much. Like, oh, oh, right. Like, yeah. oh, right. So discussed with like sex right. and not the, the sexual partner. Yes. Okay. Right. Okay. Well, you guys are talking about similar but different things. I think um, what, this, what this might come down to. Uh, one potential reason for that is that um, everyone is ugly as... No. Uh, the, the actual reason for it, it could be... Um, the, uh, during uh, orgasm, you y- your inhibitions are a little bit lowered. You know, you're, you, the kind of the part of your mm. brain. Um, so the part of your brain that kind of handles, um, I guess, what is what is the word? Um, Sexy thoughts. Yeah. The, well, the part of your brain. No, no. I no, wish no, you no. didn't whisper that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a part of your brain called the lateral uh, orbitofrontal cortex, um, like, is less active. Mm. Um, when you're having sex <laughs> and then during uh, and that that's the part of your brain that you use for sort of decision making and reasoning that's where ah, that's where all that comes from yeah so yeah, <laughs> yeah. so um so you that kind of that because that part of your brain is kind of like not switched off but definitely like working less hard mm-hmm. during sex and uh when, when you finally orgasm um, it's very few decisions. Just afterwards, to make. when it switches back on, and it like you know you're able to make good judgments again. It's like, <laughs> whoa, bro! Mm-hmm. I went out for five minutes, and you did this. <laughs> <laughs> Took my break. Yeah, but also what have there's you done? <laughs> there's. A- <laughs> Oh, quick! The lateral orbitofrontal cortex is out on its break. <laughs> We've only got five mouth? minutes to do this. Let's go. <laughs> This is such a nerdy conversation. <laughs> if I ever overheard this, I'd be like, oh my god. See, I think the issue with this podcast <laughs> is that um it's too it's too nerdy for normies, but it's too silly for nerds. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's our tagline. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna change our Twitter bio to that. <laughs> they look at um skid marks on the road. Mm. They they look at all of these things and they try to turn <laughs> Oh, God. I heard skid marks and I was like, oh. How did they get, get there? Some, <laughs> get some DNA out of some skid marks, couldn't you? That's it's very true. Not you, on the road, though. 
You could get DNA from skid marks that are on the road. You could probably work out what It'd type of car someone was It'd be very difficult to, to leave skid marks on the road. Skid marks on the road. <laughs> <laughs> like a dog with worms. I going to say dogs that like, drag themselves. Oh, oh God. <laughs> this week, the patrons have voted, and we're talking about the science of gender. Oh. 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 Jandor. <laughs> gender. <laughs> that sounds like a place in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> gender. <laughs> gender. <laughs> No, so this is a really good topic for our two-year anniversary, which is fantastic, isn't it? Two years of this. Wow, two, two years. years since Big we old can of worms, <laughs> just to celebrate two years. <laughs> <laughs> and also for two years, we brought on uh, the fifth beetle, the fourth side guy, Noah. How you, how you doing? You doing good? Yes. Good. Okay. Great. So, <laughs> <laughs> so first off, I have a question for you all. Mm-hmm. Mm, hi. <laughs> what? I'm, I'm present. Thank you. What is gender? A construct. I win. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Not, it's not real. <laughs> That's what it isn't, though, isn't it? Is it a societal thing? Is it like a, a like a like a construct? Is it a thing that you identify with? Is it a a mental it's, image? It's whatever, bits and pieces. We're, it's whatever we think. We're not it playing is. Jeopardy, but yes, uh, <laughs> all of the above. All of the above. Lock it in. <laughs> <laughs> no, so. <laughs> this is from the World Health Organization. Um, Who? Very good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just about to say, of oh, the World Health Organization. <laughs> <laughs> For a second, I was like, is Noah serious I or is he like, making <laughs> worried? And then I was like, brilliant. 50 <laughs> <laughs> 50. Uh, no, so direct from the World Health Organization. Uh, gender refers to the characteristics of women, men, girls, and boys that are socially constructed. This includes norms, behaviors, and roles associated with being a woman, man, girl, or boy, as well as relationships with each other. As a social contract, gender varies from society to society and can change over time. Now, this is a the decent... Four, the four genders. What about non-binary? Oh, this, huh? is, I was gonna say, this is a decent <laughs> This is a decent description of gender if you ignore the fact that it only says uh, women, men, girls, and boys. So, but like women and men, are they not the same as girls and boys, but just a bit older? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you turn into one. So what, you go from one. To, everyone four. transitions at some point. Just like, well, we're all trans. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> no. So yeah, the this is the the World Health Organization um, definition is it's not bad. Uh, I don't know why they separated women and men from girls and boys. Um, yeah, it could be women slash girls. Men slash That's kind boys. of the idea, yeah. I guess. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't really include non-binary identities. But it does get into that um, l like farther down on their information page. Can I ask a question? Yes. So, non-binary identities. Mm -hmm. um, is non-binary a gender? Or is non-binary um, a n not, like not having a gender? Well, I don't think non-binary people have an agenda. I, <laughs> as far as I'm aware. Unhelpful. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends no, um, on who you ask. Well, right. It's, it's, like like, an, it's like an umbrella term, isn't it? it yeah, because is, yeah. when you said it's, is it when you have no gender, that's like a gender, which is like under the umbrella of non binary. So but it, it doesn't mean that all non binary people don't identify with having a gender. Like the easiest way to describe this is um, right, male and female, or man and woman, or yeah, those. Let's Girls just, and boys. <laughs> those are the binary, right? Because you've got man or woman. Yeah. It's two. Binary two. Yeah. Anything that isn't one of those two. Like fully one of those two is non-binary. But can you be a gender that is not on the dimension? If you have a dimension, like one end is is boy, one end is girl. Mm -hmm. Is there a second dimension of gender where you can be outside of the yes. spectrum of sure. boy girl? Yeah. Well, yeah. Look, this <laughs> that is... was my nickname. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I'm, not not I'm sorry for using a slur. I'm, I'm not upset. <laughs> <laughs> boy girl. <laughs> boy girl. <laughs> Um, oh. Yeah, so like, okay, put it this way. If we've got red and blue, yeah. right? Those are those are our two colors. And for, uh, for you know, for all of time, we think there are only two colors. There is red and there is blue. Mm -hmm. And then someone comes along and says, I'm purple. I'm purple, right? And then you're like, okay, cool, right? You're purple. You are outside of the red-blue binary. But then someone else comes along. They're like, well, I'm green. And you're oh, like, well, shit. Fuck. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But, but Sorry, no, but, those, uh, but they're still they <laughs> they're still outside of our red blue binary. So that doesn't mean that they're the same. That green and purple are the same thing. It doesn't mean that they're um, that they're exactly the same as one another. It just means that they are neither like um, both of them blue. can be grouped by not being red or blue. 
Yes. Right? <laughs> so how many dimensions of gender are there then? That's... I was just thinking... I'm you just, can't answer that's that not a question. question. No, no. Well, but this is what genders. I mean, is that when you bring in, like, this idea that there's, like, things that are outside of that... So, like, if you have gender is... You start out with the idea, historically, gender is binary. Mm -hmm. Then you become the gen gender is a spectrum. And then there are things that lie outside of that spectrum. I think... So, like, what I'm trying to understand is, like, then... To me, when you start having things outside of that spectrum, the answer to me is like, well, it's all not real, so it's yeah. fine. I think gender yeah, identity so is like so specific that there isn't like every single person could be like, oh, I'm a different gender. To like everybody could have their own gender. I don't think like putting a number to it is possible. The, like the, they you, sound like they have the same same reality as like money, where it's like this is a helpful thing to categorize things and to keep account of the world. But, but it's, then not real. it's not real <laughs> yeah. in the real physical sense. And if things operate outside of that, that doesn't mean they're invalid. It just means they don't fit into our silly categorization system. Yeah. Gender um, and sex are related, but different things. Like so they correlated. can interact. They, they, yeah, well, they, not correlated. Well, you can say they're correlated, but they're related, but they are not the same thing. Mm. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. In the same way that maybe um, a Harry Potter book is the same as a Harry Potter is is related to a Harry Potter film, but they're not the same thing. I see. Yeah. I think if we think too deeply into that thought, it would be wrong. Yeah, that's so. True. Don't think too deeply. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so which part... I started talking and yeah. uh, could not. <laughs> so which part of sex and gender where happens where they replace Neville Longbottom with Dobby? <laughs> <laughs> That is outside the scope of today's discussion. <laughs> Three months. Uh, it's in a different dimension of gender, I see. Okay. <laughs> the scientists are still figuring that one out. <laughs> pretty much everyone has a gender. Um, in the same way that pretty much everyone has pronouns that are used for them. Um, you know, a lot of people. Well, everyone has pronouns. No, no, some people don't refer to me. Yeah, exactly. Does anybody have known <laughs> pronouns? No. Okay. Anyone that is not referred to. People, people, there's a bunch of like turfs that are just like, I don't have a gender identity. I don't have pronouns like you do. You do. You just haven't noticed because exactly. the one you were given is, is fine with it's you. It's fine, yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, it's like, that's that it. is why. <laughs> and that's okay. But <laughs> does it... It's okay. You can, you can be, you know. <laughs> I can't remember who it was, but um, let's call him Kevin Alexander or something, right? Um, the, some, they, tweeted, they, they tweeted something to the effect of, I'm, I don't use pronouns. Don't use pronouns to refer to me. Pronouns are rubbish. Um, and so I saw that tweet and I was like, that makes sense. But what Kevin Alexander has not understood is that Kevin Alexander um, needs to use pronouns. Otherwise, Kevin Alexander will run into situations where Kevin Alexander mm -hmm. has to use long sentences mm -hmm. replacing pronouns with the name Kevin Alexander. And such, Kevin Alexander will mean nothing. Um, Maybe Kevin Alexander is Kevin Alexander's pronouns. <laughs> Oh, maybe Kevin so Alexander. Kevin, Kevin Alexander Kevin does have slash pronouns. Alexander. It, it, pronouns are just Kevin Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> but then Kevin Alexander could not say I or me. Kevin Alexander would have to say Kevin Alexander. Yeah, imagine getting married. Kevin <laughs> Alexander, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Is this like pretty much all of your life, or are there times when you feel fairly like uh, normal? And then times when you go, oh, I'm really spacing out. Or is there just like different levels of spacing out? Um, it's, it's an interesting one, really. I would say that like it's been pretty much constant. Um, there was one in, in 2016. I remember I mentioned like when I was dreaming, I felt like there was a sudden switch and suddenly I was spaced out in my dreams as well. That was around the time when my life was very stressful. I think all that trauma kind of caught up with me and it felt like the feeling like got so much worse that um yeah so i i, I kind of say yeah like that's when it's it got bad but basically i experience it the same like all the time it's just when i'm in more stressful situations or more high pressure situations that's mm -hmm. when i feel it like i feel the effects of it more mm -hmm. whereas if i'm at home like sitting down with a book and i'm safe then i don't really care about it that much it's still there but like mm -hmm. i don't have to like notice it it's really hard when i'm like traveling or like I don't know, playing shows or something because I feel like I should be more in it and I should be like experiencing it. It's like, it's like, it's like there's a compression, a compressor on my life where I feel like I always just like hit a wall of like how much I can feel. Mm. And when I'm in something that should be like amazing, I feel like I'm like plugging my ears because I can't, I can't get in it enough. It's very frustrating. What, can I just ask, so if you have a feeling that's like, so I know what it's like to sit 
in <coughs> this room right now, right? What is it? What does it feel like right now that you imagine is different to the way it would feel like if you didn't have DPD? Um. So, if I close my eyes, I kind of just like I literally. It's not like forget that everyone's here, but I could be fucking anywhere. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed <laughs> That's to fine. Um, <laughs> It just feels like I'm dead. It feels like, and if I'm, if I get drunk, it gets like so much worse. I feel like I'm on like a thread of life. Like I'm hanging on by a tiny little thread and I could just let go and die. I feel like I'm so close to death. I'm like, I'm barely alive right now. I'm just like not, I'm just not present at all. Mm. I don't know. So I feel like someone could just blow me away as in like, um, <laughs> gone. Um, I have actually had like flashes of real, like, mm. and I mean flashes, like moments, like seconds of being like, oh my god, I'm back, I'm back, and then like mm, not. Yeah. And um, I feel like I remember one specifically. It felt like, and it does feel like it. It feels like everything is floating, and then if I feel real again, it feels like everything lands, and I'm like, oh, I'm in a room. I'm in a room, and I can feel like wow. all the walls around mm. me, and you're all there. And it just feels very solid and grounded. But right now, it's all like up in the air. And I'm just yeah. like, it's just like, I can't even describe it. I, it's so hard to put into words. At the very least, if you are, you know, you have this part of your brain that is sort of narrating what's going on and is mm-hmm. trying to make sense of your actions. And then, like Corey said, we don't know whether your actual consciousness has then got control over the, over the full body. Um, and again, trick warning trippy thoughts um but like so for example if you go to touch a stove um the signal goes up your hand to your spine and your spine tells your hand to move before that signal's even reached the brain that's oh, yeah. that roughly correct it's a reflex yeah reflex action yeah it hits your central nervous system before it hits but it hits yeah yeah yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah you don't you the conscious decider doesn't actually move the hand and also the, you make the assumption, I guess, that you are making the decisions you make because you internally experience the thought process that leads to the decisions. Oh so God. if I think, I might move my hand over there and give James a pat on the head, and then, yes, I am going to do that, and then I do it, I assume that I did the things that led up to that, mm-hmm. but also I could be just consciousness observing that entire decision right. um, chain Take place. and then making the assumption that I did yeah. that. Isn't it true that like you've already made the decision before you do it? Yeah, so um, which, this is really. I'm so glad I was reading that book that I was. <laughs> I, I, I can wipe it out. I was honestly, I was, I was meeting a friend today. I was late in getting ready because I was so interested in this book. So I was like, this is so good for today. Um, yeah, so there is some evidence to suggest for really simple things like, um, like lifting a finger. So it's it's not necessarily we can't say that all decisions happen before you've decided to do it. But with something like lifting a finger, if you look at a brain scan, there is a, there's a sort of storm of neural activity uh, before, so there's, there's three different things. So you ask people to basically, let me go back to the start and I'll just say what the experiment okay. is, right? So you've got people sitting in front of a screen that's got a timer on it, right? And you tell them, okay, lift your finger at a certain point. And you also ask them to remember at what time they saw when they decided to lift their finger and you measure what time it was when they sort of lifted their finger, right? Mm-hmm. And so you can see, obviously, they decide to lift their finger before their finger moves. We'd expect that. But there's also, and, and there's a sort of increase in neural activity when they decide to lift their finger. Makes sense. But also, before they've decided to lift their finger, there's a, there's a, a noticeable increase in neural activity, like a second beforehand. So a second before they've realized that they've <gasps> decided to move their finger, their unconscious mind has decided that they're going to decide move their finger. Decide to move their finger. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, so... Essentially, what we what we can gather from this is for like at least very simple things like lifting a finger. It may not be the case for more complex actions, but at least for this, it seems that we don't actually decide to do it. We just tell ourselves that we've decided to do it after our unconscious mind your unconscious, has already made us yeah. do it. Your unconscious <laughs> decides to tell your and, conscious to decide. So that why that comes is relevant, I guess, is that you're experiencing these moments where you feel like... Um, I'm not really doing this. I'm just watching it happen, right? And I guess um, the, the, it might be that, that actually the rest of us are just assuming we are doing it. Mm. Right. I will say, you know that feeling of like, I feel like I'm watching myself. I think with depersonalization, it's not really I feel like I'm detached. I think the I in that sentence is dimmed, you know? Like it's not like I feel like I can't, T- like I can't reach myself. It's more like I am no longer 
a hundred percent. It's really hard to describe. Like you're, like you're going unconscious. Yeah, it's like ah, uh, it's like the eye is like oh. dimmed. Like it's not like I am. Ex- it's not like I am watching myself from above because that suggests that the real you, like the, the ego more sort of awake. Thing. It's more like the more awake, not spaced out you can't reach the real you. It's more like I am l- less present. Mm. Like you're, so like you're kind of. It's like it's like when people aware. talk about sorry sorry. No, it's no, like when on. people talk about mental health with like depression, it's like oh I will like I will just you know I'll fight depression. But how can you fight it when you you have it? You know. Mm. Yes. Right. Yes. Is it is it like you're experiencing you diminishing rather than you're what my soul like I am diminished yeah. I am diminished yeah. like mm-hmm. I am less that's because that's the interesting thing is when you're talking about this experiment like you decide to do this but you, by you you mean the brain and the full system right not you the consciousness observing the system because those I, are two different yous and you're saying that you the consciousness observing is sort of fading away. Yes, correct, correct. That is exactly what it feels like. I think a lot of people, I think this is the thing, right? A lot of people think the the you, the sort of conscious, a lot of people experience the sort of you as the consciousness that is observing, but they just assume that that is everything, right? Right. As in, I think with most people, they'll be like, oh yeah, I did this, I did that. And they'll be like, oh yeah, I'm moving my arm, I'm deciding to do all this stuff. But you that are is all me. a combination of so many things. Yeah. Mm. And uh, upon read, like, on reading this book, I mean, this is this is stuff I've been reading already, but this book uh, goes into some really great depth. It's in the description. I think it's called Incognito. You should all read it. Mm-hmm. It's very good. Um, I've actually... I, I got it with you. This is one I made earlier. There's one I prepared earlier. There it is. Oh, cool. It's all my notes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a great book. But um, wow! I can't wait to read that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll lend it to you once I'm done with it. Uh, you told me you were going to lend it to me. Whoa. You, you can I both read a it. book. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. No, but the whole point. You can have it. Don't worry. <laughs> I'll get it on Audible. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't pay attention to written text. <laughs> Who am I kidding? <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> Um, I so, just wanted to feel like the victim <laughs> for a moment. <laughs> just making an anecdote. <laughs> so the thing is that what what this book kind of goes into is the idea that there are many, many, many systems that make up the sort of the sort of unconscious, and they're all layered. And then there is also the conscious mind, which is potentially one of the smallest parts of that that exists <laughs> basically to kind of say that exists basically to sort of um, make sense of the world and also adapt. Right, because you can have a lot of dumb systems, and I say dumb as in they do one particular thing, and and that is their job, and they're very good at that. You can have a lot of dumb systems, but if you don't have a sort of smart sort of overview system that can sort of say, okay, well, this system isn't working for this task, so we'll use this one mm-hmm. instead. If you don't have that, then it can be difficult to adapt and learn. And there is, and I'm not saying this is specifically what what con- the conscious mind is. This is just one idea that someone has. Um, that the conscious mind exists as a way of adapting to environments. And that's why you would see maybe some animals that have, that are better adapting, having more consciousness. One one thing, question I had was about Cory um, waking up from his dreams and he's sort of going, right, I'm having sleep paralysis, I'm aware of it. That That's quite like higher level reasoning, right? <laughs> and is that, does, so does that just wake up? like pretty quickly well that that is no that, well that is um that is one of the key features of sleep paralysis that you are aware that, that you know that you are in sleep paralysis and this is a important thing right so during dreams the self-agency part of the brain the uh, brain so the, the part of the brain that's up here again in the ceo of the brain the part that has to do with knowing that you are aware of yourself right that part of the brain is knocked out it's out of whack mm. that neighbor the brain so that's why when you were dreaming you don't know you're dreaming that's the whole thing so yeah. you find yourself in this world where you're unaware that you're dreaming which makes it much more realistic by the way right mm. so it feels much more real but during sleep paralysis because you have partial awakening of that region of the brain you suddenly find yourself awake and aware of the situation but yet you are paralyzed and that's the whole paradox you are awake and you know you're awake yet uh. you see an object in front of you 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 see this ghost in front of you and you, you can't do anything about it. So this happens to me all the time. Well, I have sleep paralysis, I'd say, maybe once or twice a year, right? Mm. And I wake up, I'm paralyzed. 
you know, and I say, my God, this is sleep paralysis. And I know a lot of, a lot of stuff about sleep paralysis. <laughs> yeah. Well, yet at the same time, I cannot help but feel fear and terror. Mm. It shows you that it's sort of an organic sense of fear in your brain that's being sort of hyperactive. You know, mm. and then you see a ghost, and you know what the, this is about, right? You have a theory about why people hallucinate ghosts, right? But at the same time, it feels so real subjectively as this conversation you and I are having right now. So you almost go, Oh, which is more real? This experience I'm having now or the real or real life? It's that immersive yeah. and subjectively compelling. And that's I guess the uh that's what it's about, right? It, it's this uh really real realistic uh experience. I think that brings us on to something that um it kind of is a nice segue into something really interesting that uh, is sort of prevalent throughout your research, which we haven't touched on on this podcast before, mm. is how sort of sleep paralysis is different across different cultures. Like mm. I, I, I've seen you, you sort of gone to Italy, you've gone to Egypt, and there's sort of different, so we talk about our sleep paralysis demons, but there's different sleep paralysis demons that are somewhat consistent across different cultures, wow. right? Or specific, as in so sort of specific cultures. Would, yeah, that, would that be right? Well, yep. that is exactly correct. So correct. So we've done research in, in a bunch of countries and what we find, what we find is for, on the one hand, sleep paralysis is very, very universal in its sort of what we call the phenomenology, meaning people will you know, experience uh, chest pressure and then they hallucinate a shadow-like being. It's usually a face-like, a faceless uh, creature. And we certainly have theories about what's going on in the brain. Why would see, you would see a faceless creature? Why can't you just, your brain does not hallucinate the whole damn thing, right? Why do you see a faceless creature? But all of that stuff uh, we, we have an idea about. But, but then on the top of that, you have the cultural element where each culture seems to elaborate on the experience. So let me, let me, let me explain. So in Italy, people will talk, talk about witches and giant cats coming and attacking them and choking them, potentially killing them. You can imagine for the Italians of the Abruzzo region specifically, sleep paralysis, you know, it's, it's something that's, you know, terrifying. It's something that is quite the thing because it's no longer just, uh, you know, your brain playing tricks on you. How, you know, in Egypt, for example, it's the evil genies of Aladdin. So have you seen Aladdin? I, yeah, yeah the, so the, the jinn, right? The jinn, exactly. So that is an interpretation there, right? So people talk about a jinn. And typically, you know, some people will say it's, they won't elaborate on what the jinn look like, what the genies look like. But some will say it's sort of a, uh, you know, it has a bloody face and things like that. And it's like a terrifying creature. But then you have, on the other hand, a place like Denmark where people will say, no, sleep paralysis, in fact, is just the brain, uh, you know, you know, teasing you. It's just your brain you know, generating, generating this experience. And, uh, and so we thought, well, this is interesting. So you have these cultural ideas about sleep paralysis, but let's then compare a culture like Egypt, for example, where sleep paralysis is super supernatural and, and terrifying and compare that to Denmark using that questionnaire you mentioned, right? To, you know, really go into depth and see if there are any differences in terms of the experience then. And what we found was intriguing. So we found that sleep paralysis in Egypt was three times more common, common in the people who experienced sleep paralysis. So for, the, for those guys, it would happen three times more commonly, you know, so they would have it all the time compared to the Danish people. And then we found that not only that, they would also feel terrified of the experience. So for, for the Egyptians, they would have excessive fear. So like 50% of the you know, people would say, look, I might die of sleep paralysis. And they would say, my, my paralysis feels much, more, much, much longer as if it's prolonged. The experience, in other words, has become much more salient and dangerous and terrifying, mm. right? And almost like a no a nocebo like effect. You know the nocebo effect? Mm -hmm. The nocebo is the opposite of the placebo. The placebo is I give you a sugar pill, I say, look, you know, Corey, take this pill and you will be the best person in the world to play basketball, like the space jam. <laughs> <laughs> placebo. The nocebo is the opposite. I tell you, look, this pill here, you take it and you'll die from it. Okay, you take it and literally your body will react to it. And we think it's a similar like effect uh, culturally that's going on because of the cultural ideas, you know, the, the experience is changing. So let me give you a concrete uh, example of how this might work. So this is what I call the Little Lisa example. So you have this little girl called Little Lisa. And by the way, this mm -hmm. is almost, this might be the punchline of my decade long research, which is this sort of theory and this work. Uh, it goes something like this. Little Lisa, she's having dinner with her grandmother. And the grandmother would say on this island, look, you know, there's this monster. It's called the boogeyman. It will come at night. You know, it looks like this and that. It might choke you. 
It might sexually violate you. It might you know, potentially even kill you. So it has all these features and she'll describe in detail how the creature looks and stuff. Now, little Lisa, mind you, she has never experienced sleep paralysis in her entire life. Okay, never. She goes to bed and then she will experience sleep paralysis for the first time. And the question is, why and what happens? Well, first of all, she's lying there paralyzed, but she has fear parts of her brain being overactive. So she has anxiety and stress. And anxiety and stress can do what? Well, it can sort of make your uh, cortical regions, the part of the brain that has to do with awakening, awakening, to become hyperactive during the REM phase and wake you up. So this is one component to this. Second, you know, when you are expecting something, I'm expecting something, I'm almost primed then to experience it. So little Lisa will sort of monitor paralysis sensations in her body. And when she sort of feels like she's half awake, she might try to move to see if there's something there holding her down. And so when she tries that in a conformatory way, she will wake up during the sleep paralysis REM phase where she is paralyzed every night, right? So she'll wake up and look and behold, you know, lo and behold, she'll see a creature, a shadow-like being, and then she'll project her cultural ideas into that being because of now the, the, the ideas that what we call uh, dream mentation, rem mentation, meaning the, the ideas of her imagination and memories, you know, taking over. And then she sees a ghost. She wakes up. She's terrified. OK. And then she might go tell her friends about it. Right now, they are also predisposed to potentially having sleep paralysis. Now, that fear will lead her to have another sleep paralysis two days later. And a week later, and it then potentially becomes chronic now, and she becomes more and more and more terrified over time. And potentially, she might even develop mental illness. And this is really where it becomes mysterious. So we think, and our data uh, suggests in a preliminary way, meaning it's not 100% confirmed, but it seems like potentially having these huge traumas, like seeing these ghost-like creatures, like continuously over time, and developing anxiety and fear around that. So it sort of escalates with each, with each episode, it becomes worse and worse. Or well, the creature is not only there to attack me, it's I'm possessed now. It's personal. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And then mm. over time, this becomes minor trauma in their own rights. So small traumas accumulate and over time potentially can lead to a, maybe PTSD-like experiences, actual trauma, maybe anxiety. That's what our data seems to potentially point at, which is really interesting. So from from having ideas put into your mind as a little kid, right, about cultural ideas, to now potentially develop something like a trauma, you know, comparable to somebody who's in war just from sleeping. So this is what I, you know, suggest that is might be one of the most mysterious and fascinating condition in the entirety of medicine uh, because we can, uh, you know, extract something like that. So that's pretty interesting. So what it sounds like you're saying is that like cultural ideas of like demons or um, like creatures that come in the night to get you, that yep. sort of primes your anxiety so that you're more likely to try to wake up in your in your in your sleep, um, which exactly. and 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 then that kind of spirals and spirals. But the the key thing that there it sounds like is that the kind of initial, um, like the genesis of that is the cultural ideas um, of sort of monsters, demons, and spirits, etc. Uh, would that be fair to say? Yeah. That is fair to say. And in fact, if you look at those who have the highest rates of sleep paralysis uh, is college students with disrupted sleep and anxiety and stress for exams. They have some of the highest <laughs> rates. <right? Yeah. laughs> so exactly, right? So you have, you have that anxiety and you know that predisposes you. But I, I want to add here, it's important to note, and this is our research really suggests this, you know, at the same time, there is a key component which is biologically based, meaning if you are on a desert island, I, you know, you would, you know, likely, uh, you know, hallucinate ghosts and things like that too. But however, you know, there's an element of culture, you know, added onto that. So in the U.S., for example, you know, some people will talk about space aliens, uh, you know, abducting them. And, and it seems in some cases, maybe not in all, but in some cases, it might be something uh, along sleep paralysis people have suggested. And, and, and it, so there is an extra layer of culture. Let me give you a concrete example. There was once a reporter interviewing for like, maybe seven, eight years ago from New York. And during the interview, she told me, look, my own sleep paralysis in New York is about burglars. People coming into my house and- I you know, get that. Yeah, I get that all the time. Mm-hmm. So it all depends on sort of your culture in a way. But at the same time, there is a shadow-like creature that's universal. It tends to be faceless. It tends to come from 
the window or the corner of the room. It tends to have these features. And believe it or not, I actually have theories about why it's faceless, why the windows, why all this, because of the underlying biology of our brain that can sort of try, you know, try to get at these things. Would it, this is just, I'm just going to throw this out there. Would that be off the top of my head, would that be because we, we struggle to uh, sort of construct a face, right? Uh, is that is that because I've, 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 and you could probably confirm whether this is true or not, but I've heard a lot of people say this, that the faces that you see in dreams are not sort of new faces. They're faces that you've seen before because a face is a very hard, a very difficult thing to construct mm. a sort of believable version of. Yeah, my, that, that is fair. So the theory might go something like it's, you know, they're, they're, they're simple and complex hallucinations and for your brain to simply hallucinate a uh, shadow-like being, it's more, it's simpler. So if you have an idea of a ghost-like creature in your room or a terrifying presence, so some people might, you know, just uh, hallucinate uh, a sense presence. It's called a sense presence hallucination. So they might have that. But hallucinating a shadow-like creature and having an idea about where it is in space, that's, uh, you know, adaptive in terms of your survival. You don't need to hallucinate all the features. So it, your brain is computationally, uh, it can use your, your computation and your brain power, so to speak, to more uh, important tasks instead of hallucinating all the details. So absolutely, it's a, I, mean, I believe it's a simple hallucination in that way because uh, your brain, uh, and you, especially, specifically your visual systems, try to get away with as little work as possible to get, your, to get the job done. This mm. is well known in, in vision science. So I think that's what's going on here. And, uh, and, and, and so, yeah. <laughs> Most women show genital arousal to both genders, regardless of whether they, yeah, like what they say they are. Someone mentioned this to me the other day. I, maybe it was you. It's basically, there's this idea that all women are bisexual. I definitely didn't. I definitely did not say that. Um, but we have spoken about that before. Um, is that the idea? It's like the sensational like headline after the research is published, but it's not like it's not the research isn't like all women are bisexual. It's just saying that, like, genital-wise, cis women show arousal that can be, like, discordant with the actual sexual attraction that they feel. Their genitals yeah. just get aroused, even if that's not how they're feeling. Fascinating. Um, well, what did, you, what did you decide to do on the back of that, then? The, so the idea that, um, sort of, the, the, sexual, the genital arousal um, difference between uh, cis men and women. Well, I was like, if there's a difference between cis men... And women, where do trans people fall on this? And there'd literally been one study done before on trans women um, where they had a group of 11 trans women uh, basically take part. None of them had had lower surgery. They all used the penile gauge. And they were like, oh, yeah, they show like typical male arousal. And I was like, that's interesting. Like given the sample size, they didn't have any bisexual trans women take part. And the authors of the paper, I'm not going to say who, but like just I was suspicious I was like, I don't know how good this is. <laughs> and I didn't really like the paper. I, I was like, I want to do this. Mm. Um, but like for me and trans men, because I want to try and get a larger sample size than 11. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 We could, I mean, because we've talked about this before. I mean, we've talked about this last week, actually. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, 11 as a small sample size could be, it's a good pilot study. You could decide maybe should we go go on with this? But when people start making... Sweeping statements. Don't make your conclusions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like I spoke to I spoke to ten of my friends, and all of them are queer. So I've concluded mm -hmm. that everyone on the planet mm -hmm. must be queer. Good yeah. study, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, also, yeah, it's <laughs> a fair so, fair conclusion. Yeah. Also, there are no black people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, that's not true. You need um, some black friends. I have black friends. <laughs> they just don't like you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think well, okay. This you kind of touched on something that's uh, interesting to me. Look, do you remember? Um, a, a, gosh, months and months ago, um, when you sent me a paper and you were saying, "Oh, this might be a, an interesting, th a interesting thing to look at for Psy guys," and I started reading it and I sent, and I sent back to you. I was like, "I am certain this was written by a turf." Is this the one that ended up being part of the BBC study? It was about. It was a, there was a BBC article on it. I, I, we don't need to go into what it specifically okay. was about, but um, I, I and I just want to ask you because you, oh, you yeah, will have read, now. yeah, you will have read a bunch of sort of studies um in regards to trans people. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like when when you start reading it, you can almost tell what someone's views on the topic are? Oh yeah, in mostly by the language they use because yes. it's mm. like so this one on like trans women one of the authors was a big researcher in autogynephilia, which instantly mm. just made me go, 
oh, well, you got a very small sample. It's literally the only study done on this. You didn't get like a huge range of like sexual attractions, like self-reported sexual attractions. And this is the conclusion you're drawing. Um, it's difficult to like quiz science yeah. too much when you weren't there and you can't see like the raw data and look at it yourself. But when you get that vibe, I always like get yeah. suspicious. Well, this is because <laughs> I remember that that paper that Luke sent me. Um, and I, I remember reading it. I was like, this language feels off. And I, I was like, I won't judge. Obviously, I read the whole paper. I was like, I won't mm -hmm. judge it. I'll look at it and I'll, I'll, I'll see what I think. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to take the author's name, go to Twitter. <laughs> and her head, her, her header on Twitter oh, no. was just yeah. fully like a turf slogan. I was like, oh, oh okay, no. cool. I'm glad that I, I'm glad that I can, you know, pick that out just from, just from that. But it is, it is interesting because I really feel like when you're looking at sort of um, trans people in science or the, the sort of science in regards to transgender people, it is such a minefield in terms of what what is influenced by what bias. And I think mm -hmm. what's really interesting um, is when you look at a lot of studies that are touted by transphobes, you'll find where they get their information from, wh wh sorry, where they get their um, participants from, where they get their data from, is really often skewed very heavily in a, in a, a per direction. Yeah. So for example, I think one of the, um, uh, one of, I, I can't remember the specific study. So take this with a, a massive grain of salt, but. I kind of remember one study talking about, um, I think it was detransitioning or um, sort of the sort of comfort or happiness of trans people after transitioning and where they got the participants or how they got the information was by asking parents of, oh, that was it. I just yes, remember, oh my God. Yes. I, I distinctly remember what it was. Rapid onset gender dysphoria. They got that oh, from- Oh, is this the Lippmann paper? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They oh, got they got people from like Mumsnet or from like, yep. an, like they got parents from like basically anti-trans anti -trans websites. Transgender trend, like yeah. li literally like oh. these websites that, <laughs> it's like, what do you think of your child's uh, gender dysphoria? We're going to ask you, knowing that you've gone to websites that are trying to persuade you that your child is going through a phase, uh -huh. like, and then they base conclusions off of that. It was terrible. And I, I just, I, 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 honestly, what baffles me to this day is that people believe that rapid onset gender dysphoria is a thing based on a bunch of parents who were surprised by their kids coming out as trans so mm. much so that they went to forums <laughs> to figure out what was going on instead of like to, like surely if like it wouldn't have been such a surprise if they'd had a better relationship with their child and been okay with this like, is like the ending of it's a sin the end of it's a sin where one spoilers. of the one of the mums is like like super shocked that her son is gay um and her son is dying of aids and everyone around him knew he was gay and in part you know, he, he he hid that he was gay from his parents. And so, you know, to a certain mm -hmm. extent, you, you, you can't necessarily expect them to read his mind. But equally, that's the sort of point is that she's sort of running around like, how 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 could I have known? Why is everybody blaming me for not having known? Um, when the reason probably that he didn't tell is because there was a sort of homophobic environment at home. Um, and that's a sort of similar sort of thing, isn't it? Is like, um, yeah, it's rapid onset if you're in denial the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> so you don't spot it. <laughs> I think this is, I genuinely think a lot of people, a lot more people would be more bisexual if there were fewer societal um, pressures not to be. Yeah, well, the Romans my, yeah. were pretty bisexual, my, weren't they? My supervisor said, why do you think that all these trans guys are bisexual? And I was like, well, they're already trans. So mm. they're probably a lot more open to exploring their sexuality. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. like, if that's how you're feeling. Um, and it is, they've done studies on, like, trans sexuality and stuff mm. and numbers and most trans people do not identify as strictly like straight or gay. Videos were three minutes long um, with three featuring a male model, and this is a direct quote, and three featuring a female model masturbating. These stimuli had been previously selected to be the most arousing videos from a large pool. And that's from a 2015 <laughs> paper uh, by, I think, Rieger et al. Um, yeah. <laughs> Voted for by the people. Uh, Did somebody do a scientific paper on the most sexually arousing videos they had to do like a prequel paper to select the oh, okay. pornographic videos they were then going to use in an arousal paper right so it had to be like scientifically selected and it had to be lone people masturbating rather than people having sex because yeah. they found that you don't know what people get aroused to when it's two people having sex yeah um but it was very boring what were the what did the videos <laughs> look like were they in a 
what, what were the rooms like? Because you'd have to. So were the? Mm. Do you know if the videos were made um, sort of exclusively for the study, or did they find them else? No, they were found on porn sites. Really? Yeah. Well, what if what if perhaps a, a, a pink pillow were to influence? <laughs> what if you're not <laughs> you attracted I mean? to people That's... masturbating? We did get like a few comments from people going, "That was really boring porn. That was like really <laughs> like just that's not what I watch. I'm not into individual people." But then it's like you still got aroused. Like the right, people, like okay. even the people who would verbally come out and say that was really boring, <laughs> and the, their graph is like saying yeah. the opposite of <laughs> they still they still got turned on by it. Right, but, Good but I think yeah. that's but I think that's different. I think there's two there's two different kinds of arousal. You know, I mean, there's I, really because you can be physically aroused without feeling like ooh, all horny. You know, Does that don't make you guys know mm. no or the yeah, other right. Oh, yeah. right. Okay, yeah. I see. Yeah. You're yeah. like. You're like, oh, this is, I, I I don't really find this attractive, but evidently someone does. We um, did also take, like, uh, people voted after each sexual video. They voted on how attractive they found that person. Really? But there's a really odd question of, like, would you date this person? And, like, so many people were like, no. Oh. Like, that's not, it's not really a relevant question in your, like, <laughs> attraction in this three-minute video yeah. of somebody naked like yeah. You, you, yeah otherwise tinder would just be videos of people masturbating and you swipe like right or left yeah. based on that right naked um, attraction right yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um but, so no, go on no just typically uh like for cis men the kind of genital arousal would correlate with these self-reported responses on the specific models hmm. so like even if they found it boring they would still say yeah they were attractive <laughs> I was like this naive PhD student trying to like discuss stuff with somebody who'd come from a very transphobic scientific background, but was not transphobic themselves, but just the knowledge they had was not good. What? So I struggled a lot with terminology. Like I mm. wanted actually to describe sexual orientation as like sexual orientation labels and just mm. explain how it works for trans people. And he was like, that's too confusing. And he did let me submit a paper with it in and they rejected it because like and one of the that, reasons yeah. was like that's too confusing and i was like but you accepted it being like the wrong labels for years what bothers me about transphobes in general and this goes for most sort of bigots people that are sort of homophobic and stuff as well mm. it always comes down to disgust like you can pretty much peel away everything and then it's just oh this this thing disgusts me like oh, i'm homophobic but why are you homophobic because gay people are evil blah 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 but when you dig into it they just find it a little bit disgusting. Yeah. Mm. And it, Icky. It's just that, like, sort of... <laughs> Icky. <laughs> it's like, you like, like, <laughs> get that on a, on a, like, a low level, and then they rationalise it with all exactly. this other stuff on top of it. That's exactly yeah. what, like, gender-critical TERFs do. It's mm. like they're, they're basically trying to come up with a rationale for being transphobic. And that's why it's become so mainstream, because it mm. doesn't sound like transphobia. Because they're just like, we don't want men in women's changing rooms when people don't know they're talking about trans women. Exactly. Like, but it, it's it's so frustrating because it's so easy to just peel away and dig down and be like, oh, you felt a little bit disgusted and you didn't know what to do about it, so you decided that they were the problem. And you didn't want to be a bad guy. Yeah, cool. So, yeah, yeah. You, you, just, you were disgusted and were like, okay, but how, how does this make me the victim? Yeah. <laughs> 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 I actually spoke. I spoke to quite a couple people who were so um, who went to religious schools, oh dear. and so a lot of them were saying that one person, the only apparently the sole piece of sex. This is what they actually said: the sole piece of sex education they had around LGBT sex was that it is difficult. That was it. <laughs> um, and I have a story. I went. I went to a Baptist school for one year, and in sex ed, we got told that gay people make bad life choices, and that was all we learned about gay people. Can I? Yeah. I don't it, think that's. On. I don't is think it, that's. Is un... it they make bad life choices in general. Yeah, I, I, don't, don't, think like, I don't think that's untrue. Invest no. poorly in the stock market. They don't say for a time. As in, as in, we did the sex ed as normal, and then a student asked, "What about gay people? How do gay people have sex?" And the teacher was just like, "Oh, I, I don't think we should talk about that. I, I think gay people make bad life choices." That's, I don't think that's not necessarily yeah. untrue, but I don't think it's down to them being gay. No. No. Some gay people will make bad choices. I think a lot. Some of straight them. people will make bad choices. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Everyone, any, anything in between of those things. Some of them will make bad choices. I think gay people make bad choices. I think that's perfectly true. Not all of them, though. <laughs> Not all of them. I think it's just a I comment on the just... human condition more than anything. <laughs> yeah. people, 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 gay make people are people too. Okay, they can make bad choices just as much as oh, everyone else. Fa fallible. Yeah. 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 yeah.
people available. Yeah. Some of them are gay. <laughs> well, when are we... <laughs> <laughs> Unrelated. I that kind of t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> some people are... All people are fallible, some people are gay. That's Anyway, new merch drop. Oh my god, I actually want that. Can we, can we get that? Like, all people are fallible, only some of them are gay, you do the math. And it's just like, <laughs> so confusing. That's a great t-shirt. Yeah, let's do it. Let's, let's do, do it. it. <laughs> merch drop coming soon. Oh my I lord. That's my favourite quote of mine ever. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm going home. That That's interview done. That's, that's, it. My mind. Is that actually, that's the conclusion. Of that's the study, conclusion. Not... That's what we wrote down. <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> So the general findings were, uh, especially among women who have sex with women, defining first sex was incredibly difficult for them. Mm. And that had a lot of issues relating to um, the ability to validate your own identity mm-hmm. and feeling unable to. So some one, a couple of them were feeling like um, you're only queer or you're only LGBT if you have had the experiences. And if you can't define those experiences, it's almost like you haven't had them. Yeah. And uh, for some of them, they were saying that they were constantly asked what it even is to have sex with a woman, all this kind of stuff. For men, it was very much along the lines of um, kind of penetration. Um, mm. But there was also some talk of like affective, uh, so emotional ways of knowing, oh, it, that felt more passionate or more intense or something like this. Can I just ask? Yeah. Um, what, what, is the generally, what is the general consensus on first time when it's a woman having sex with a woman? Because I wouldn't know how to define that in a way that would change that wouldn't change the definition for other people. Yeah. So that's the issue. Yeah. Is ultimately we're basing on a framework that is based around heterosexual sex, which yeah. is penetrative. Mm. Um, so I think that there are some studies that say the general consensus is oral sex with women right. is the kind of goal. But then I think there's a lot more critical health psychology that's saying ultimately there shouldn't be a standard definition mm-hmm. because that excludes things like oral sex, which has connotations and also has ramifications in regards to sexual health, or it excludes um, digital hand stuff and that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And when you when you start isolating it, it can be good for research, but it can also be quite reductive and exclusionary. Can I just when you say digital, you mean with fingers, fingers as in yeah, the yeah. digits, not digits. just just not for, <laughs> for anyone listening or watching. <laughs> <Digital>. Not webcam <laughs> sex. Not 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 online sex. Digit as in digital. But it also it also excludes stuff like that, like yeah, yeah absolutely, yeah. stuff like that. Which yeah. is that sex? Is that not? Who knows? That's why I think it's really interesting. To me. That's what's really interesting to me. I was thinking about this earlier, actually. That the whole concept of virginity is kind of messed up. I don't mm. care. I don't find it interesting if someone is a virgin. Yeah. I find it interesting that they've not had sex. Does that make sense? As in, if someone is like, and you're just meaning sex as a different thing to the so, traditional heterosexual sex, yeah. well, in, in any in any sort of sense. So mm. if someone's if someone says if someone being a virgin and someone not having had sex, they they kind of operate as different things to me. In that, if you've not had sex, that's just an experience that you've not had, which I find interesting. Like if someone said to me, "I've not had ice cream before," I'd be like, <laughs> "Yeah, that's interesting." Yeah. So like, I'd be like, "If you had sorbet," I'd be like, "No, I've never had sorbet," and I'm like, "That's mm. very." <laughs> like a, what about like a what about like a very cold cream? Have you ever heard that? They'd be like, yeah, I've had a cold cream. And I'd be like, and you never wanted to try ice cream, <laughs> <laughs> just never. And they're like, well, Froyo? I don't want to. What about you know, Froyo? Yeah, Froyo, Froyo, right? Froyo. Froyo. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Exactly. Um, and but if we had a word that was just like for someone that hadn't had ice that cream, hasn't had ice cream, like them, like someone being a, like a non ice cream haver, like as a thing, wouldn't is that like them being that isn't an, as interesting that yeah. them being that is not as interesting to me as them not just having experienced the thing. Yeah. Does that yeah, make sense? It's, it's, the, it's the experience or lack thereof that is more interesting to me rather than the sort of identity around the person. Yeah. I you guess know? it's like in the old world, um, the concept <laughs> the concept of virginity creates itself the necessi- necessity for the concept of virginity. So if, mm. if, if losing your virginity is built up as this big deal, when you've crossed that boundary, it is it is because you've made the crossing of the boundary, yeah. which only exists because you made it a big deal yeah, in the first yeah, exactly, place. Exactly, yeah. And 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 sort of the introduction of a sort of broader definition for virginity or for having had sex sort of makes that less of a hard line and more of a fuzzy mm. line. Yeah. And it's more about an emotional transformation. Like you've crossed into a different set of experiences that a human can have. Yeah. Um that aren't necessarily exclusively about penetrative sex. Yeah. 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 I think I it's and it's it's definitely something that there there has been work going towards that where people are looking at especially in sexual health psychology you go back to the 60s and it is just the most awful things to read. It's like um you know 
anyone who has premarital sex is going to die, that kind of stuff. And then uh, the 80s came along. That was a science. That was, science in, that was in a paper that I read. <laughs> it's going to die. It's not, not specifically <laughs> those <laughs> words. Hold on, hold on, hold on, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> to be fair, not untrue. <laughs> Sorry. That is the truth. They are going to die. Uh, <laughs> they are gonna die it's but... just like it, some people make poor choices. Some of them are gay. Exactly. People who have premarital sex are going to die. So is everybody else. <laughs> so is everybody else. Yeah. This is, this, that, that is exactly the kind of title of one of, like, of one of those papers that I was talking about earlier. It would be like, anyone, everyone that has premarital sex dies. Well, you read die. the paper. Everyone dies and some people have premarital sex. I got you. Maybe we should start publishing a bunch of troll papers <laughs> where we just put like, arbitrary categories on things that, that explains everybody. <laughs> How are those going to pass? Peer? Oh my God, let's just make our own journal for just pointless let's, papers. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Oh my God. New merch yeah, drop coming. <laughs> <laughs> we can sell a, a, a zine of terrible <laughs> science papers that we have made up. I genuinely... That are technically true. They're all technically true. <laughs> I genuinely think we could do that because actually I was, this is somewhat unrelated, but it's something that I want to bring up on the podcast at some point. So I'll just do it now. I was looking for um, a journal of sort of um, negative results as in, you know, the results that are not the results that someone was oh, looking for. Insignificant yeah. results. And yeah. Non non-significant results rather. And yeah, that, exactly. that would be really good to have. There have been a couple, but I think they've, 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 some of them have discontinued. But I think under Sci Guys, it'd be very cool to try and start a journal like that at some point down the line. So let's uh wow let's do that new Patreon goal yeah new, <laughs> genuinely new Patreon goal it'd be really it'd be really cool I think that would be amazing it'd be amazing right that'd be really cool yeah. awesome and we'll tie it in with our pointless results and you have to figure out which is which <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah so yeah no uh what were we talking about before so defining first X and what oh, the yeah. implication of that was yeah I guess the good question for me there is then if if you are defining sex in a certain way for women who are having sex with women. Does that not then necess necessarily necessarily change the definition of first time sex so, yeah, for it, other people? It does, and this is this is the issue a lot of other papers have. So this is why there is so little research into this. It's because it's so difficult to create any scope, and it's much easier to just go penile vaginal pen penetration. Yeah, and sorry, put that down. Can I just like this is what's really frustrating. It, it's you. Right, so it makes sense that you've done the sort of qualitative approach here because if you were to do quantitative, you have to, you'd have to yourself sort of create find, that definition. Yeah, mm. and we've we've had this definition up until this point of what sex is, and we've the, you know scientists they've come across something that doesn't fit into their way of sort of um, categorizing things, mm -hmm. and instead of re sort of reassessing that, they just, just like. <laughs> But, let's just ignore it for now. Let's put let's yeah. put lesbians to the side, um, right, yeah. and let's just pretend like they don't exist. As opposed to and like instead of thinking like, oh, actually, yeah, no, hold on, our conception of sex in society is maybe mm. a little bit more complex than we have given it credit for, and that might be affecting our results. So I just you know, feel so like it's unboxable. Like people, mm. the scientists want to put things in boxes so that they can compare them. Mm. And I think if you include every sexual orientation, it's not possible to construct a box other than yeah, like yeah, yeah. anything more than kissing. So but then it's also not, sorry. That's actually good. Anything yeah, to do with genitalia. But then it's not, it's, I wouldn't, you say with other sexual orientations, and this is something that I was going to sort of come in with earlier, that you talk about heterosexual sex, but this idea that there's one, one mode of heterosexual mm. sex is such a pain because one, let's bring in, like, like, okay, let's, let's leave trans people out of this for now, right? Just, just forget it for a sec, right? You're so scientific. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at me, I'm scientist. I'm, yeah, uh, um, <laughs> I'm leaving out a category of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. So, uh, what's really interesting to me is that you, it, heterosexual sex, right? We have this idea of what that is, but ultimately, first off, pegging is a thing. Like mm. heterosexual sex, uh, as, as sex between uh, a heterosexual man and a heterosexual woman, does not necessarily need to be like whoop, whoop, whoop. PIV. It doesn't need to be that. There are so many different ways for that to happen, yeah. right? And, and yeah. then when you bring in trans people, then there's another layer of complexity. And you can just keep on adding these layers of complexity. And we, yeah. we let, we're, we're literally doing it in this conversation right now where we're simplifying it by saying heterosexual sex. Yeah. But heterosexual sex isn't even necessarily what we, like, by its broadest definition, it's not what we mean when we say heterosexual sex. I try and broach that a little bit in the paper by mm. basically saying a lot of them say heterosexual or penile vaginal, but this basically what they mean is mixed gender, so mixed sex or gender, sex uh, between someone who is um, predicated by the gender binary as two people of the opposite sex, um, which is a already arbitrary term as well, mm. um, and having penile vaginal intercourse that's that's the definition and ultimately you're right like if if they have um anal sex that's excluded even though that has a, a man and a woman doing that is, is that has the exact same implications mm. or oral sex is excluded and that kind of thing and it's just 
as soon as you start excluding so how i defined it in the study to get back to how i did mm -hmm. it was was i just had it self-defined yeah right. so and this is the thing with, with one of the papers that i read the only other paper into this from contemporary times uh they had anything from sexualized kissing onwards and that's what their definition was um but i thought that that was I, I putting it as a self-defined thing and then asking them what that self-defined thing is, yeah. I think is a much easier way of doing it. And then you don't have to create this box and exclude people. You can have the research onto the effective outcomes and you've already got what they've defined it as. So you can mm. categorize it if you need to. Mm. Um, and it's just, it just wasn't hard. It just isn't hard to do this. <laughs> It reminds me of what you were saying of this field of psychology called positive psychology. And um, so basically, for years and years and years and years, people have been looking at problem-focused situations in psychology. Like, how do we treat mental health problems? How do we get people who are having mental health problems to be better? Mm. And then this, there was a huge wave where someone was like, okay, but what about the people who aren't getting ill? How do we look at what they're doing mm. and see if there's a way of stopping, preventing these mental health sides side effects happening and so um ultimately it's called positive psychology because it's, it's focusing on the things that are good and trying to consolidate those in people and so ultimately you're saying is don't just go this is so important don't mess this up it's it this needs to um be really really important it's, it's exactly what you're saying ultimately let's reintroduce this idea of okay let's make sure everyone is having the best time possible mm -hmm. remember that this can be an it can be an impactful thing for you so just make it good and have mm. that as the the baseline rather than you know trying to prevent bad trying to consolidate good yeah because ultimately the realization that a first traumatic experience is going to have long-term negative effects is only helpful if you then try and make sure people yeah. don't have negative first-time exactly. experiences. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. It's, it's no good when it's already happened. The most Versus. profound thing that I've ever been told was mm. from a guy doing a statistics PhD, and he wasn't trying to be profound. He was just <laughs> saying something that he thought was helpful, because I was doing a statistics project on uh, hierarchical linear modeling. I just wanted to show off that I was smart. Um, <laughs> and so basically, it's a really, you nest variables inside other variables. It's very interesting and intricate. And he was doing his PhD on this type of modeling. Um, and so I was basically asking a question about this baseline assumption of this model. Mm -hmm. And he went, okay, so there's this stati statistician called Box. It actually exists. Uh, I know, crazy. Didn't create the box plot. Completely different box. <laughs> um, so he said, um, all models are wrong some are useful and that was that stuck with me ever mm. since as like a very profound like existential phrase but i just mm. i think it's, it's it yeah. explains it perfectly yeah. it's like every model you use is going to be incorrect because it's going to be limited by how we perceive reality and limited by what is available so you can be a romantic but still you love to get it get it on yeah absolutely cool yeah and that would be a romantic yeah no, no, no. That would be aromantic and aromantic. Aromantic would be someone that's uh, a very romantic person, Luke. Yep. Thank you very much, Corey. <laughs> what about aromatic? That is a, that is a compound <laughs> that has a benzene ring. <laughs> or it's very nice smelling. This is like one of those TikToks where it's like, or like one of those Twitter threads. It's like, no, not aromantic. You're thinking aromatic. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's a compound with a benzene ring. You're thinking asexual. <laughs> yeah. Say. What a nice memory. What a good year That's of the most thinking guys. I've done in a while. Wow, it was really nice, wasn't it? My favorite bit was that bit where we all remembered together. I liked that part. I mean, isn't that what it's all about? That's what it's all about. The, the remembering together? Friendship. Yeah. Well, you know what? You remember Psy Guys from this past year. What do we usually end Psy Guys with? A quick fire quiz, usually. <gasps> mm hmm. Ooh. Dun, 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 dun. 2021 edition. Wow. Wow. So the rules for the quick fire quiz are the same as always. Don't forget, I remember them. I'm going to keep on saying remember this episode. <laughs> so I will ask you one question. The two of you, the first person to answer the question correctly. After I finished asking the question, don't forget you got a buzz in to answer the question. Wins. What do they win, Jamp? Nothing. Gosh darn. Right. The good memories. In fact, you know what? No, the winner gets to keep their memory machine. Wow. I'm joking, of course. I need to destroy it because um, it's too powerful. It is. The, mm. the memories were too good. Yeah. Too you destroyed the time machines, now the memory machines. What are you going to do next year? <laughs> I don't know. 
<laughs> I've already run out of ideas. Um, but what I know to do, what I remember to do now, is to ask you, Luke, what is your buzzer? <laughs> Ooh. Jab, what is your buzzer? 2021. Very good buzzers. So my question for you is, where can our lovely listeners buy our merch? Ooh. Uh, 2021. Damn Luke. It. That's not a memory question. Uh, they can buy it from normalcitizen.store. You gosh darn right. That's true. Jab, do you want a chance to answer? Uh, yeah, well, rem- remembering back to the beginning of this very episode, normalcitizen.store. That's normalcitizen.store. Thank you all very, very much for joining us on this journey in 2021. It was really nice, wasn't it? It was. I feel like I blinked and it went by. Yeah, it's just gone, hasn't it? All the memories happened at once. Well, we've got a lot of cool stuff coming in 2022 for you, <gasps> which ugh, is crazy. Some really cool stuff. Too Some, many twos. Oh, yeah. We've got a guest yeah. lined up for January already, I think. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah, That'll be have... fun. Yep. So we'll see if we can get some for February. Ooh. So, you know, stick around for Sci Guys. All of that stuff. I don't know. Subscribe. Enjoy. Goodbye. Is that it? That's, That's it. it. Happy That's holidays. It. Merry Christmas and all of that. See you next year. Uh, the Christmas has already happened. It okay. was yesterday. Was it? Yeah. Oh, well, I hope you had a good Christmas. Well, Happy New Year. And before we go, we would like to thank all of our patrons and thank you for watching. You can find the full references for this episode in the description. Subscribe for new episodes every Sunday. And why not leave us a nice wee comment? You can support the pod over at patreon.com forward slash SciGuys or join the community on our Discord. Or you can find a contact us at SciGuysPod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and here on YouTube. Or you could get us at SciGuys on TikTok too. That's SciGuysPod at gmail.com. SciGuysPod at gmail.com. <laughs> this year has been a long one, I'll tell you that. You can follow me at NotCore everywhere. You follow me at Jamkin everywhere. You can follow me at Luke Cutforth everywhere. Hey, audio listeners, you notice how the outro was different? It's because I, I didn't do an audio one this week. Just live with it. All right, goodbye. Goodbye. Go to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs>